You say you don't know if we're dead or alive Let me fly, let me fly, oh Throw a coin into the trevi fountain Let me fly, let me fly So nice to see you all here. My name is Leo Kalyan. Um, this song was called Trevi Fountain, and I hope you're enjoying it. And uh, I just want to let you know that um, this song is about queer friendship and queer family. So I hope you guys are having a good time here today. With you. I just wanted to say welcome to Student Pride. Um, this song is called Trevi Fountain. It's a song I actually wrote um, when I was at uni um, about one of my best friends who I made at uni and a trip that we took together to Rome. And it's a, really about celebrating and loving your chosen family, your queer family, because it's really, really important to build these bonds and cherish them and love your queer friends because they are your chosen family. So happy Student Pride. Thank you guys for having me, and this next song is called Horizon. shape of a thought we're on the cusp diamonds or dust 
raise me up with your Midas touch, hazy golden rush. Make me swim and dissolve, make me sin and then fall. I see your love on the horizon, like a kingdom of gold. Bring me in to your fall. I see your love on the touch you're dangerous but I'm unafraid of the drugs don't push your luck cause I'm coming up wake me up with your Midas touch hazy golden rush make me swim and Thank you, Student Pride. I hope you guys have an amazing day. I hope you guys have an amazing time at uni. Make the best friends that you can and cherish your core family. Thank you. Good night. Well, not good night. I say good night, but actually, have a great afternoon. <laughs> Bye. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to National Student Pride. Can we get another round of applause for Leo Callian, please? Isn't he great? He's great, isn't he? So, I am one of the co-chairs. I'm Max. And I'm Georgie. I'm the other co-chair. <laughs> and we're here to give our introduction. Because National Student Pride was founded 14 years ago now after a homophobic and bigoted talk at Oxford Brookes University. And we've come a long way since then because today we are hosting the largest LGBT plus careers fair in the UK upstairs. Uh, and now we have over 130 different universities represented. So we've come a long way. We continue the same fight that we started all those years ago, calling out homophobia on campus, which is an issue that is still very prevalent. Except now, we also call out transphobia, stigma, and taboos in all areas. This year, we are commemorating 50 years since the Stonewall riots and challenging racism in the LGBT plus community. We'd like to thank and give a huge thank you to our platinum sponsor, EY. We'd also like to thank our gold sponsors, Clifford Chance, ASOS, and Just Eat, and all 85 brands and charities at the Pride.Careers Jobs Fair upstairs. So on this stage today, you're gonna see Monroe Bergdorf, Paris Lees, Peter Tatchell, and the living legend himself, Ian McCallan. 
and so many more incredible people on top of that. We've got a great lineup. So please remember to use the hashtag Student Pride today to join the Pride of Conversation and get your message up on our screens. Follow our Instagram story too, at Student Pride. Have a freaking amazing weekend. Be safe, be queer AF, and be proud. Thank you guys. Now please welcome your glamorous hosts. It's James Barr, that's me, and Juno Dawson. Hello. Hello. How I are you? I can't see you, but I feel very close to you right now. Um, hello, we, we shouldn't assume that you know who we are. It's very true. I mean, if you don't know who we are, you're trash. You are trash if you don't know who we are. But um, we'll, we'll help you out. Yeah, um, we'll To you. my left, to your right, we have the wonderful James Barr. He is half of the podcast Gay and a Non-Gay. He is the silky smooth voice of MTV chart show and also their new series um, asking for a friend which deals with pubes. Issues, pubes. pubes actually you're all on pubes. pube watch by the way today because of this midriff there's a tiny a tiny <laughs> no, bit of pubic it. hair no, there, might isn't, pop there, out. Isn't, there isn't there um, isn't it's gonna be yeah just keep an eye <laughs> and if you could tweet pube watch no, please, to the sorry. hashtag that would be great um and also, as well, James is an amazing stand-up comedian as well. He was just sold out a whole run above the stag. Thank so you. So amazing. Um, and Juno Dawson, as we know, is incredible and the best-selling author of international successful book, This Book is Gay, and also last year's Cosmo novel of 2018, Clean, which is a genuinely amazing book um, and it's amazing to be with you today you know I've hosted Thank this you. for five years now five long years I know alone and here I am with you weirdly I haven't aged at all sure Jan I, I have aged and I am tragically old enough to be your mother if I weren't so barren um, <laughs> but uh, 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 destiny um, but yeah no I'm really thrilled to be here James and I are already a tiny bit drunk because of the VIP launch and it's only gonna get worse yeah. So if you could take pictures of us now when we look <laughs> coherent and my makeup Hang isn't on. smeared. The light? Are we smoldering? Are we smizing? <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, but the rule, and because I'm so much infinitely older than you, I do feel very maternal of yeah. you right now. So You're between, the mommy and I'm the daddy. He wishes. But in, in between every alcoholic drink, drink a tiny glass of water as well. That's the way to do it. Because don't forget, in about 17 hours, you're all going to be down heaven at GOI watching Trinity the Turk from off of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 4. So yeah, pace yourselves would be my advice. But James, what have we got coming up on the main stage? So please? as we all know, quite a lot going on today. And this is the pride of conversation. It's amazing to be here. Um, I absolutely I absolutely love Student Pride. It's my and first Student Pride. I've never been. This um, is very exciting. So today, the 50 Years of Activism panel, Pride Not Prejudice, a very special edition of the National Student Pride podcast, hashtag Queer AF, with guest host Evan Davis interviewing LGBT plus icon, legend, Ian McKellen. Amazing. It's P Gandalf. <laughs> plus also, Strictly Come Voguing. Which, which on our notes is spelled strictly convoozing. <laughs> I, I think voozing is something different, but I'm excited <laughs> to find out what you kids are up to these days. I think I did some voozing last night. Uh, no, he did. <laughs> um, upstairs on the next stage, and this is, this is I'm going to have to try to get up there to see this. We have therapy puppies. Um, so I'm probably going to go cuddle a tiny puppy right after this. And there is a panel looking at the plus in LGBT plus and the student sex work panel where there is also the Pride Careers job fair and the music stage with Smoke Radio. We're currently being streamed live on YouTube and very soon we will be live streamed on metro.co.uk's Facebook Live. So as soon as that happens, guys, no swearing, no naughtiness, no drinking. Just I want everyone to be very well behaved. It's quite a big deal. So if you need to let any of that out of your system, now is the time. In the words of Davina McCall, you are live. Please do not swear, you cunts. We also and that is the last you know time. What? That's it. No more. No more now. A Apologies, apologies to our signer Finished. who uh, had to do that one. Uh, actually, I'd really like to le learn that word, Juno. If you wouldn't mind just saying it again, so I can no, just. No, I'm not. I, don't know how, I want to know how to sign it. 
Okay. Oh, oh no, you're joking. Really, that's awful. That's so bad. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, when, when we are live, uh, we do want everyone to be getting very loud and involved and telling everyone at home who's watching or wherever they are how amazing a day we're having. So, let's practice that now. Is everybody ready to do a big cheer for the Facebook Live? Let's do it. Three, two, one. That's sounding pretty good, guys. Can we have later on for the Vujing, can we please have a little practice of a Yas Queen? Yeah, three, two, one. That was so millennial. Yas Queen. <laughs> yeah, like really half assed. Yas Queen. Like half assed um, Queen. Please do. We've said it before, but please join the conversation today, and your messages will appear on screen if you use the hashtag Student Pride. There has been a tiny little lineup change. Originally, Ian McKellen was going to be on our first panel. Don't worry, he's still going to be here later, but um, he's not going to be on stage for the first panel. But the first panel is about to begin and is incredible and is going live on the metro.co.uk Facebook. So please do give it a huge cheer when it starts. Um, it is our incredible 50 years since Stonewall panel. Roll VT. Hi, I'm Jake Edwards. I'm a trans and non-binary YouTuber and I am here with Peter Tatchell. Today we're going to be talking about activism since it's been 50 years since the Stonewall riots. Of course, the Stonewall riots were not the first fight back by LGBT plus people, but they were the most significant, the most dramatic. And what was significant was that for the first time, LGBT plus people said, enough is enough. We're not gonna put up with police harassment anymore. And the really significant thing was not the riots themselves, important though they were, it was that they led to the formation of the lesbian and gay liberation movement. Um, the modern movement as we know it today which began in New York after the riots, but then spread out the United States, Britain, Europe, and many other countries. And how do you feel personally about that time? I began to be involved in LGBT plus activism in my homeland of Australia about three months after the Stonewall riots when I read in a local newspaper a report that thousands of LGBT plus people had marched through New York to demand civil rights. I remember thinking to myself, wow, Yes, that's what we need here. That's what we need everywhere across this whole planet. So that must have been a really profound moment for you personally, if you were just coming into your own identity and moving forward with your activism. Yeah, previously I'd been fighting for everybody else's rights, you know, against the death penalty, for Aboriginal rights, against the war in Vietnam. But now I was fighting for my rights as a gay man and for the rights of other LGBT plus people. Um, for me, it was the beginning of what became, what has become, my 52 years of LGBT activism. What do you personally think of activism today? Well, of course, in decades past, LGBT protest activism was much more visible. People forget that hundreds of LGBT plus people got arrested in this country fighting to end discriminatory laws. Um, you know, we had to risk our lives and liberties uh, confronting far-right extremists um, you know, breaking laws to highlight the persecution of LGBT plus people. But clearly there is still unfinished business, particularly for trans people and non-binary people on the whole issue of gender. You know, that is the new front line of LGBT plus politics and I think it's really amazing and positive that those ideas are now to the fore. I think it fascinates me as a trans person that there was this sort of middle moment where trans people were maybe not so important to the movement you know we started out on the front lines of the riots and now we are sort of the front face of activism um, in, in the sense that that's what we're striving towards is equality for trans people but this middle moment do you have any sort of recollection of what that was like and yeah i think there was a whole period of lgbt plus activism which was predominantly gay male, uh, not lesbian, not bisexual, and not trans. Being from a much younger generation, there's a difference in how I see activism. Activism today for people like me, it's a lot more social. It's a lot more about social change. It's about education. Whereas the activism you did was more riots in the streets, sending letters, making changes to the law. So I think my personal focus is on 
trying to achieve that social change, trying to get rid of that um, oppression that we feel in the streets rather than within the law. Um, sort of cultural. Like yeah, cultural make, making shift, a cultural yeah. change, yeah. You can see both me and Peter at National Student Pride from the 22nd to the 24th of February. Go to studentpride.co.uk for more information. Well, good afternoon, Student Pride. Hey. Well, aren't you the luckiest people on this earth to get to witness the first panel of the afternoon, which is something that's very, very close to my heart, hashtag activism. So what is the panel about today, everybody? I think we need much more power and strength behind that as a movement. What is it about? Activism. Well done. That's the kind of strength I like to hear. I am Dr. Ellie Barnes, and I'm the CEO of Educate and Celebrate, and I get the most wonderful pleasure to be with you this afternoon and also those watching us on metro.co.uk Facebook Live. So please feel free to be part of the conversation. Now, you can tweet and you will see at the screens, your tweets will come up at the side there. So please feel that you are part of this conversation. Now, I am sitting here with lots of my heroes this afternoon, and I'm sure they need no introduction, but here we have Jonathan Blake, we have Peter Tatchell, and we have Paula Akpan, and Paris Lees um, is on her way, will be here any second now. So just wanted to comment on what we've seen. Yes, 50 years of activism from the Stonewall riots. Um, that was when we took to the streets, that's our community, all genders, all sexual orientations, all races, you know, and that is so important. And I just want to ask Paula, first of all, you know, that was led by, the prominent leaders were trans activists and moreover, trans people of colour. And is that an important thing for us as activists? Oh, absolutely, it's huge because I think black and brown people mobilised most of the movements, if not all, of the movements that take place. So it's being at the very bottom or being seen at the very bottom um, due to you know, living in a white heteronormative society. So then we end up representing and fighting for everyone because you can only free everyone once you've freed black trans people, black queer trans people. Um, so it's huge that it was started and kind of well, this particular event was um, headed up by all recognisable faces, such as Marsha P. Johnson. Yeah. Um, but also, it's worth re remembering that a lot of these movements have been happening, or like there were little, um, there were organisations um, such as, I think it was like Marcus Hirschfeld started um, like a gay rights, the first ever one in the world. So I think Stonewall was a particular time, it was a particular moment, and it was a huge catalyst. But there have been organisations beforehand as well, which is quite interesting. That's a, that's a really good point you're making, because it was in a particular heated political climate at that time. Mm. Peter, do you want to comment and expand on that? So what was happening at that time? Why was that the time for the uprising? Well, of course, the gay liberation movement emerged in the context of the black liberation movement and the women's liberation movement, and also in the United States in the huge mass movement against America's aggression against the people of Vietnam. So it was in a revolutionary era that this movement arose. Um, the year before, in 1968, there'd been the student rebellions in Paris, um, there'd been the Cultural Revolution in China, there'd been the uprising, the non-violent uprising in Czechoslovakia, which was brutally suppressed by Russian tanks. Um, this was a period of global rebellion, and of course, in the Global South, there were liberation movements. Uh, in the Portuguese colonies of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, there were liberation movements against Portuguese colonialism. There was the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. There was the um, movements in South Asia, um, in uh, Indonesia. Um, the Communist uh, Party had been suppressed, and a million people had been slaughtered, but there was still rebellion there. And of course, um, in East Timor, they began their fight for liberation from Indonesian rule. So that's the context 
the global context in which the LGBT plus movement arose. Great, that's wonderful. Thank you for giving us a perspective on that. I just want to come over to Jonathan. Now, Jonathan Blake, founding member of Lesbians and Gays Support the Minors. So we're moving on from 1969 here up to 1984 when you formed. Did any of what has happened over here inform the kind of activism of the LGSM? Oh, of course. <laughs> I mean, there's always been this incredible sort of movement. Um, and politically, it comes out of, really, it comes out of the trade union movement in this country yeah. who want to push barriers and push things forward. And for members of LGSM, Lesbian and Gay Men Support the Miners, it was a really important time. There was this battle between Margaret Thatcher and her government that wanted to smash communities. She didn't believe in society, yeah. which was crazy. So everything had, had, had informed us and, you know, we wanted to be there. You know, it was a battle that needed to be fought. Yeah, absolutely. That building cohesive communities is absolutely key. Yeah. Completely. Um, and that takes me back to, well, the legalisation, homosexuality, 1967, up till Stonewall Riots, <laughs> 69, up to in 84. And, yeah. of course, we had the dreaded Section 28, which came in 1988, yeah. which stopped us, you know, for me as an educator, really from mm. introducing queerness into the education system, you know. I mean, what was really interesting was that when Pride, the film, came out, um, there were a, a, a number of us from LGSM who would go around and we would meet with, uh, with students and with school kids. And I remember the very first time that, that we went to talk with a group, uh, there was a member of Stonewall and he got up and said you have to remember that if section 28 was still in existence we would not be able to speak to you yeah. and that was frightening and you kind of thought yes yeah. you know that that it was really it was a way of sort of just getting rid of a whole portion of society yeah absolutely it's like we're eradicated there was yep. a silence yeah. around it yeah. so the Stonewall Riots then, coming back to Peter, how did that inform what happened with Pride? Because the first Pride March, a year after, was it that strength, do you think, that was gained from the Stonewall Riots that led to the first Pride Marches? Well, as the video just mentioned, um, the significant thing that came out of the Stonewall Riots was the formation of the Gay Liberation Front yeah. in New York. And that led to a march demanding civil rights in late 1969, and then following that came the idea of what became known as Gay Pride, but was actually called the Christopher Street Gay Parade. Um, Christopher Street being in the gay village area of New York. And once it began in New York, it quickly spread all across the US to Britain and many other countries. Yeah. Um, so it was a movement that had a global impact. Brilliant. And of course, we're still seeing that global impact ripple out. You know, in so many countries, just in the last decade or so, like in Jamaica or Uganda, they're having their first pride parades, and often in circumstances of great danger, yeah. which is an incredible um, you know, fact of their, their courage and determination, um, given the fact they're likely to be, be arrested or beaten. Mm. So pride is still an ongoing process of rippling out, and there are still many countries that have never, ever had a pride uh, movement. Um, there's still many countries that don't have openly gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender movements. Yeah. So, for example, I was working with activists in Sudan some years ago, yeah. and they've never been able to openly organize, let alone have any kind of protest, because mm. the penalty for homosexuality in Sudan is death. Mm. Yeah. So do you feel, Paula, that prides are? We're here today. We're celebrating today um, with all these lovely voices on this conversation today. Do you still feel that pride is a protest? Are these places for activists like ourselves? Yeah, because we're inherently political. Just existing in your queer body is political. Yeah. Um, but then I think it then is further compounded when you are black or brown, when you are trans, because despite kind of being a core part of the movement, there are also very like specific cultural nuances or gender identity nuances that get left behind. 
And I think especially with being LGBTQ+, yeah. you can feel like, well, I'm part of a marginalised group, I'm oppressed as it is, so therefore you can't also put that kind of oppression towards other people within your community, which then means that black and brown, queer and trans people get pushed out further from the community that is meant to be like a home or a space to us. So we, yes, there is a lot more visibility, but then if we're not involved in kind of the creating of these organizations or creating of these events, yeah. then there are only certain voices, there are only certain people um, who are platforms, which is unfortunately tends to be cis gay white men um, and it means that a lot of the other voices within our community we get pushed out and therefore have to create our own spaces so for example Lady Phil with UK Black Pride or you know Pussy Palace or Babes is having to form these different spaces outside of um, kind of traditional maybe pride areas because we don't see ourselves and therefore sometimes feel quite unwelcome. Right, which is really sad. And we can look at the flag today. I've seen that there is the flag on the floor. Have you all seen that today? Yes? Oh, they got a round of applause. Brilliant. So it'd be good to get your thoughts on that, because what you're saying, that, that is a kind of intersectionality that we're trying to get all our voices together. And that's kind of being represented in the flag today. So we've got the rainbow flag here. We've got the trans arrow. And we have um, race. I think we have that down the side there. You know, how do we feel about this new, new flag? How do you feel about that, Jonathan? Do you think it's a good thing? Oh, I think it's always a good thing. <laughs> I mean, I think that, I think that visibility is yeah. really important. You know, and that goes right the way across the board. You know, for me, um, as an HIV positive person, it is really important that one becomes visible, that people sort of learn to, to you know, understand what this disease is about and then deal with it. And we need to sort of battle against stigma. So yet again, you get this, this you know, another sort of movement within, you know, the gay and lesbian movement. Yes, because we forget there are so many different movements within Absolutely. our community. Yeah. Yes, not always homogenous, yeah. No. No, Peter, do you want to comment on that? But of course, the traditional six or eight color flag was never intended to represent people or communities. It was to represent values and ideals. Right. So by adding the black and the brown, we're introducing a representation of a group of people and a community which is very different from all the other colors. Right. So maybe we need to completely redesign the flag so it's inclusive of all peoples and all colors and ditch all these values. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> is it about the values? Is it about the colors? Because I know they all mean quite positive. It's life, love, healing. Life Harmony, love. peace. Or, yes, yeah. so yeah. they all mean quite, yeah. quite positive things, don't yeah. they? I, I think it... I can understand some of what you're saying, but also it's remembering that we're not all on an even playing field. Yeah. And it's, it, we don't want it to turn into an all lives matter kind of situation when talking about the flag. Um, and I think it's really important to note that this, having these colours can be quite important for some people because it feels like, yes, visibility, but also that can't be it. There has to be more than that. There, we have to go beyond just calls for visibility because then we end up, it's, there's room to fall into like a safety pin situation yeah. where, you know, like white people were wearing pins that said, you know, if you feel threatened on a bus and come find me, but that's not enough. And if you are kind of within this marginalised community, you want to see structural change rather than, well, we've added in two colours, so, you know, <laughs> you're good. So we're all right now. <laughs> but, but I would, I would yeah. add that if we are going to add in other colours to represent other marginalised communities, I think it's actually quite insulting to people of East Asian origin, Chinese, Japanese, Malay, and so on, yeah. for them not to also be included because they are an excluded minority or a marginalised minority within our own community, yeah. which don't get the attention that they rightly deserve. Absolutely. And there is that thing about the hierarchy. You know, is there some kind of hierarchy of equality going on here with mm. the flag? How no, I'm, not, I'm, not, just oh. I'm not against it. I'm all oh, in favour yeah. of inclusion. <laughs> yeah, of course. But I just think it has to be really inclusive. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's also worth remembering that brown often means 
people who identify as South Asian but also East Asian. But I think if there is kind of within the um, East Asian LGBTQ communities these kind of feelings of discord, then that's an intra-community conversation for them to be having rather than for us who are not East Asian people to be having on their behalf. No, they are having the conversation. I get yeah. East Asian people saying, it's great that there's black and brown, yeah. but why isn't there a colour to represent us? Oh. We are constantly excluded and ignored in the LGBT community. Right. And that is totally true. Yeah. You know, people from Malaysia and China and Japan and Taiwan and those countries, they are not included in the mainstream LGBT plus narrative. And I think that's wrong. They need yeah. to be included, which is not to exclude you or yeah. black brown people, it's just we want to make it fully inclusive. Yeah, totally. And Taiwan, of course, I've just got this week, I did read this week, now got um, same gender marriage. <laughs> so the first Asian mm -hmm. country to do that, am I right? Uh, I haven't heard. Yes? Am I right? Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I read that somewhere this week, so great. So maybe this is yeah. up and coming, can be sort of part and feel more part yeah. of this. But I think it's indicative, we're not listening yeah. to East Asian people in our own, own community. Yeah. They come to me and my organization and tell us yeah. we're not happy. Yeah. We want to be included too. And I think they have a valid voice and they should be listened to. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Did you want to make a comment? Yeah, no, no. The, 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 the comment I wanted to, to make was about the pink triangle because, you know, when I was growing up, it was the symbol for, for, for gay liberation was actually the pink triangle, which was the, the symbol that okay. uh, was used in the concentration camps to denote homosexuals. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of sort of, you know, I think is a really important that one remembers that history. Yeah. And that symbol was, was there, you know, for that point. Yeah. And that kind of seems to have gotten forgotten yes. within the kind of the, the rainbow flag. Yeah. Now we are really touching on the next place where I wanted to sort of take us, which was what, what now are the, the key issues? What now are we, act, it's 2019, <laughs> 50 years of activism. Oh, hello, Paris Lees, everybody. <laughs> That's okay. Hello. Well, you've timed that quite right. So I just, <laughs> hello. Hi. Thank you for joining Hi. Hello. us. <laughs> Let's get your voice on this straight away then. So just reached the point about, we've been talking about activism right the way for the last 50 years, and we've just reached the point where we're going, well, what are the key issues right now? What should we be um, debating? Um, and what does activism mean today? What's it mean to you, Paris? Well, obviously, I'm very passionate about transgender rights, so I would say that protecting trans kids is the number one issue. Um, I'd really love to help adult trans people who are struggling, but um, it's much easier to make sure that people don't grow up with all of the complications and damage that comes from being bullied and being rejected by your family than it is to uh, deal with that later down the road. And I've been really inspired recently uh, by the campaign to raise money for mermaids, which saw uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez come in along with Mara Wilson and uh, H Bomber Guy who's a YouTuber and Susie Green at Mermaids and I, I took part in this live feed this this fundraiser and it was so amazing to see all of these people who aren't actually directly affected by trans equality coming together to try and make life better for trans people so not only am I grateful uh, for that solidarity I'm genuinely so inspired to be a better ally myself for causes that don't directly affect me because we're under attack and my struggle is, is, is your struggle and you know I, I can't remember who did the quote now but it's it, it, there's variations of the quote nobody's free until we're all free um, so I, I, I feel like every struggle is, is important but we're going to have something that we're, we're passionate about but we, we're not going to do this if we don't all come together as an LGBT and you know wider community. Absolutely so why do we feel that we're so far behind because I get that sense as well uh, around gender identity because when I go into my schools now it's all about gender identity is it just that there is a lack of knowledge is there a fear you know why are we so far behind in understanding um, gender identity do you want to comment on that? Well, I, I feel like it's maybe harder for me to weigh in on that as like a cis 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Paris. Okay. Do you want to carry on the conversation there, then, Paris? But, well, all right. But, but, but I think that you know one of the, the, the reasons comes back to this, this dread of Section 28, right. where sort of you know all talk of homosexuality, yeah. uh, you know, gay, lesbian, sex was completely sort of forbidden. So in terms of classroom and and, and sex education, yeah. you know, uh, it was just removed. It was not spoken about. And I think that that leaves a huge gaping hole in people, you know, in kids' education. Yes. So how on earth can you sort of, you know, you, you've got to open it. And, you know, that really, I mean, I think that it's, it starts with schools. Yeah, yeah. Ab did, absolutely. Sorry. Well, I, I would just say I think that um, not to criticise anybody else's campaigns or activism, but we're talking about activism, right? Yeah. Um, I think that maybe some of the campaigns for me um, was maybe not what I would have chosen to focus on. So, for instance, the, um, the Gender Recognition Act. I think it does need reforming. I think there's some issues there. Um, and I, I know that it means a lot to a lot of people. It meant a lot to me knowing that I could change my, my birth certificate when, when I was a teenager. But um, I feel that all too often we can get sucked into other people's agendas. So we spend so much time firefighting um, these horrible sort of, you know, going back to Section 28, you know, trans people are rapists, predators, that sort of thing. And actually we're not focusing on the stuff where we could make a real difference. And I, I feel like we were making some progress a few years ago in framing trans rights as an anti-bullying issue. And ultimately I think it is an anti-bullying issue. And I, I would rather see as much effort put into what I'm calling for, which is every school in Britain to have uh, a robust anti-bullying policy that explicitly protects against all base of gen gender-based bullying, whether that's misogyny, homophobia, or transphobia, because nobody should be getting bullied because of their gender in 2019 in Britain. And uh, th that's not controversial. That's something where we could actually you know, people could get behind. It's very hard to argue with. So I think it's about how we frame the arguments, actually. And I think that maybe we need to think in the trans community about how we frame this so that we're not constantly put into a reactive, defensive position where, where we're allowing other people to frame the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yes. you for that. I mean, we do know. I mean, our, our young people were not born with prejudice. It's just really as simple as that. We're not born racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic. We've got to remember these are outside influences that are put upon our young people. So I just would like to sort of explore that a little bit further. So what are these negative outside influences? Why does prejudice get to our young people? And why, for me in education, are we having to undo this and unlearn, get our young people to unlearn that in schools? Do you want to comment on that? I think because we're still thinking about concepts of racism and like transphobia as like an evil that cannot be perpetuated by everyone like all white people are racist because we're born into a racist society where you are hierarchically placed at the top and i think it's only until we start thinking about right how do we go about dismantling or having these really difficult conversations without feeling personally affronted or being like well i'm not a racist because xyz it's not about you it's about the system that you were born into and thinking about that abstract rather than this one racist person, therefore this one person is bad. Um, and I think once we start having those conversations, especially with younger people, and exploring that more, then that's kind of, that will be a sign of progress, I think. Can you tell us more about your work and what you do and what your goal is and what do you want to achieve from the work that you're doing right now? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the co-founder of Black Girl Fest, which I started with my friend Nicole in 2017. And we basically decided that there's no space for black British women to kind of convene and have access to workshops and panels and masterclasses on like the scale that we wanted to throw it on. Um, so we were thinking a lot about the different things that we would have liked to have seen when we were younger. Um, so for example, being a queer black woman, it was, I wanted to be privy to conversations about what it's like to be someone in the black community who may not identify as cis or as, you know, as straight, and then having those conversations, especially with a particular lens, a cultural lens, um, and, you know, what it's like existing in Afro-Caribbean communities with those identities. Um, so then if I had those conversations when I was younger, then 
I, who knows what my journey might have looked like. Um, so we've programmed loads of different things around, you know, politics of hair and beauty and gender and sexuality. Um, and yeah, we just threw a festival and it was really stressful, but we did it and we're doing it every year. So yeah. How can people jump on board with what you're doing right now? Um, so it's literally, you can just come to the festival. Um, so we prioritise black women and femmes, obviously, because this stuff, all of these workshops, all of the work we're doing is for our community. Um, but also, you can donate. Um, <laughs> but we know that there are white parents who have mixed race children for example and don't know how to do their child's hair or don't know what products to buy or things like that so it's kind of a space for education and growth for all but with a particular you know there are a lot of master classes that are just for black women femmes because we want to be funneling that knowledge to our community directly so brilliant thank you very much so Paris, yeah. I just want to jump on that and yeah. say just how important it is and obviously honoured to be on the panel with Peter who's, you know, we all know what, what, what you've done for human rights and I think that there's a bit of a, uh, for me there's a contrast between your kind of activism and, and what is considered to be an activist in, in 2019 because um, there's this selfie activism you know which is if you put and that's great and it's a really important role for social media you know and I I definitely wouldn't have the career that I have if it wasn't for Twitter you know so it's it's not to diminish that but I think to I think it, it, it's not a replacement for, for you know grassroots activism and I think people need to be donating they need to be looking at where they're shopping they need to be organizing they need to be turning up you know you need to be active to be an activist um, so yeah that's that's what I would say just like what can you what can you do to help and I think the best advice that anybody gave me was when I was thinking of getting into activism um, I contacted a youtuber uh, an actress called Calpurnia Adams does anyone know who Calpurnia Adams is um, and she said just do what you can you know just, just do what you can and for me that was writing so there's something that every single person in this room can do to contribute to make the world better for LGBT people and for everybody and um, yeah that's that's what I would say thank you very much is just could, could I, you, I, yes. I, say, I, I would like to row back the conversation to the very opening question yeah cause I think we sort of skipped a bit of that <laughs> um, for those of us like myself who are involved in the early lesbian gay, bisexual and transgender movement. It is very, or it was very different from today. For a start, the word equality never passed our lips. We were not interested in equality, we were interested in liberation. Um, the premise of equality is that you want equal status with what they have, with what is. And the critique of the LGBT plus liberation movement in the early 1970s was we don't accept the status quo. We don't accept things as they are. We want to change society for the benefit of everyone. We don't want equality within a fundamentally unjust society. So the agenda of the early LGBT plus liberation movement was to make common cause with women black people, the Irish people struggle, working class people, and so on. We saw a coalition of the marginalized to come together on the basis that unity is strength. And if we each supported each other, we would collectively be stronger. So that's why, for example, the Gay Liberation Front in London was the main supporter of the early women's liberation campaigns, the main non-women's organization that supported the early women's liberation movement, doing big, big protests like at the Royal Albert Hall during the Miss World Contest in 1971, where GLF's contribution was to stage an alternative pageant on the street outside with misconceived, mistreated, misunderstood, etc., mm. to highlight the sexism and misogyny of that competition. We were also the only non-black group to rally in support of the Mangrove Nine when they were on trial. These were nine black activists in West London who were framed by the police. The Gay Liberation Front was the only non-black group there to stand in solidarity with them because we understood that the struggle of black people or women or the Irish was part of a common struggle for liberation. Mm. So I think equality is a problematic concept. Of course, we do want equality, but not within the system as it is. 
the agenda must be about social transformation. And bringing up to today, mm. I think what is so fantastic is that we are in the throes of a new revolution, a gender revolution being spearheaded by trans, non-binary, and gender fluid people, which is questioning all the orthodoxies around male and female, masculine and feminine. And in the process, is going to liberate us all. Mm. Because those are nice little boxes that tradition and orthodoxy has set up. But we know that most people don't fit into those boxes. And we want everybody to not be the prison or the prisoner of gender. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So putting together what Peter's just said, I want to come to you, Paris, and just say, do you, do you feel now, as a younger activist at this point, are we collectively stronger now? I mean, especially in this political climate that we are in right now. What's your sense of that now in 2019? Well, I mean, I can't really compare it to the 80s, but I think that definitely in the past couple of years, I've seen people have got on board with the idea of intersectionality, and, and that felt like it was quite an esoteric academic term not that long ago and it's like you know basically we're all woke now aren't we um and you know we're all kind of showing up for other people's struggles um it's so disappointing to me that a lot of the hostility um to trans rights comes from people claiming to be speaking up for equality you know claiming to be feminist and i you know when i was when i was at university my favorite quote was the dale spender one um i can't do it ad verbatim but you know she says you know feminism has fought no wars it's it's you know done no, done no harm done no evil you know um when somebody says you know are you a feminist i say yeah why wouldn't i be um and it's like well actually i feel that a lot of people have really tarnished that they're using feminism and there is there's no excuse for bigotry whether it's dressed up as religion or ideology or or feminism so that's just so disappointing to me and actually you know th there are a lot of people who are very hostile towards trans people who write some really good things about you know women's services being cut or about male violence against women and it's just like if you could just focus on that and we could find the common ground to actually fight back against these systems of oppression that affects everybody, you know, it's, it's very depressing to me to see people who are not served well by the current system. Um, and, and, and this idea, you know, that, um, that, that I would support male violence against women, that, that, that I've never been affected by domestic violence, that, that when I'm walking down the street by myself late at night, that I don't feel worried if I hear a man's footsteps behind me. It's just, it's so cruel to do that to trans women, say you, you're going to get all of this shit, you know, for being a woman. And oh, I'm not supposed, they told me I'm not allowed to swear because it's being streamed. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> Uh, they knew what they were signing up for but it's <laughs> and then you get all of this extra rubbish on top of you know uh, saying you're not a real woman and it's like well i'm i'm being you know i'm being treated like a woman for, for the purposes of patriarchy so it's like you know uh, yeah it's just it's very depressing so i'd like to see more unity but you know for me the young people give me hope they they really do i think the yeah. kids are going to save us um with the with the with the climate change activism i don't know about you but i personally i'm so angry no offense you know but um but, but sort of uh, gen, gen x and, and baby boomers the people that are running things and sort of screwing everything everything up at the moment. I feel really, 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 really let down by them and their inability to do anything about climate change. And I do want to talk about climate change because, you know, Sir David Attenborough said, you know, it threatens uh, the breakdown of civilization. And I wonder if people have really thought about what that means, because civilization means civilized norms. It means people respecting each other. It means rule of law. It means having food in supermarkets. And we all need to be climate change activists first and foremost, because who do you think societal breakdown is going to affect first? It's LGBT people, it's BME people, it's, it's minorities, it's disabled, and it's real, and it's, 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 it's going to happen. So I think we all need to pull together and work out what we're going to do about this, how we're going to come together to face some of the very, very big, real existential threats we as a human race face, yeah. because otherwise we are literally going to die. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. So, Paul, you as a, a representing the youth perspective as well, just picking on that, sort of like the the activism, the issues going forwards, is intersectionality, is that the key thing that we should be looking at now? 
yes, but not using it as a badge. It's like, well, I'm intersectional, intersectional because I have these kind of identities that cross over. It's like actually thinking about the oppression of the people at those apexes and how we are adversely affected rather than kind of, well, you know, I had like a black friend who <laughs> was queer. You know, it's, yes. it's actually thinking about meaningful and structural change. And, you know, there's a lot, I think there's a lot more work that's being done around decolonization in terms of decolonizing universities. So thinking about the curriculum that we're taught, which yeah. is, you know, pale male and stale, and how that informs um, the way that we all kind of think about uh, education and um, informs people's actual journeys through higher education, or decolonizing um, like healthcare and contraception, for example, because black people weren't included in most of those studies, so therefore it's always skewed um, and disadvantaged, like we're at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So thinking about the ways in which um, our society actually affects marginalized communities because we were never considered and then it's like only then can we actually have those meaningful conversations yes thank you very much and um, thanks for all those amazing points i do want to start sort of summing up now at this point so i want some final final gems of information here that we can give to this lovely crowd here and everybody watching on the metro.co.uk on the facebook live of how you can get involved you know so just to give some gems what can we do what are the issues going forward how can people jump on board so can we all give a little bit of gem of advice and we've got about a minute each to do that so we start over here with jonathan well, I think, as, as, as Paris has said, I think the, the, the main thing is to deal with the major issue, which is climate change. And I think that should be the area that galvanizes everybody, because it affects the whole human race. So one doesn't have to break it down into smaller units or what have you. Dealing as a human being, that's the area that one needs to, to look at. And go for it. No, no one's going to respect your pronouns when people are fighting for food in the supermarkets. You know, and it's not that it's not yeah. that you know trans equality is one or the other. I'm saying that it is dependent on everything's dependent on the planet. But what I would say is the best advice someone gave me as well was just do what you can when you can you know like uh, there's the whole thing in activism of, of burnout right you know where we're because we're, we're passionate and we want to make the world a better place particularly if it's something that's close to our hearts and i would just say everybody has a contribution so it could be a little thing it could be helping an individual person who's struggling with something it could be making sure that your workplace has a uh, non-discrimination non policy that explicitly you know put, you know make, uh, there's, there's something in place for people who've got HIV or it could be um, you know making sure that your school explicitly um, states about uh, gender-based bullying and and uh, you know racially aggravated bullying so th there's everybody can do something it could just be a conversation with your parents you know um and that's what i would say is that you've got the power to do something so do something wonderful thank you so much peter do you want to give some final gems Not about gems but hey <laughs> um every social progress in history has been the result of collective action of course the only social reform worth fighting for is one that will benefit the individual. We must never lose sight of the individual. But the way you get that change for the individual is us by coming together and working for it. So I would say it's the collective power of us, whether it be as LGBT plus people, black people, women, disabled people, people struggling for liberation around the world, it's collective action that makes change. Yeah. And when it comes to LGBTs, our activism has been crucial to the changes we have won and have yet to win. And I always like to say that an LGBT activist is an LGBT person who's got up off their knees and said, enough. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you so much, Peter. And um, Paula? Yeah, um, I think at 
being called an activist can be like quite a scary term and it makes you think that you have to go to protests and be picketing and there are actually loads of ways that you can um, be showing everyday activism so whether it's um, donating to someone's like top surgery uh, crowdfunder for example yeah. or you know donating to mermaids and just thinking about the different ways or the different changes the minute changes that don't feel necessarily hugely revolutionary but actually having a profound impact beyond you um, and thinking about what you can do with those wonderful that's great thank you so much for that i truly hope all of you out there are feeling totally inspired and totally empowered to go out there and make that positive change because you all can it's all of our responsibilities so please can you give this fantastic panel paula akpan peter tatchell paris lees jonathan blake the most amazing round of applause well done well done thank you so much thank you thank you brilliant and enjoy the rest of student pride Woo! Hello. Thank Can you so we have much, another massive round of You're applause welcome. for our Indian activism panel? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Yeah. Uh, please give up everyone oh. on this amazing panel. Yes. Enjoy. Thank you. I wanted a longer hug than that, Paris. I feel like you were too. I wanted a squeezy one. Thank you. Feel. Yeah. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Do you want to read, Pet? I'm going to start slipping into Cheryl Colmerd intermittently. I don't know, you put a microphone in my hand and was like, how are you doing? I'm so pleased to be here. But um, don't go anywhere. Um, or if you do need a wee, go. But then come straight back. Because we've got a piece of activism that you can be getting involved with right away. My t-shirt might be a bit of a clue. And then straight after that, it's our next amazing, and may I say, very, very good looking panel not to take anything away from the previous panel that was also very good looking but the next panel is I mean I'm triggered guys it's a lot as an ugly person I am triggered by the next <laughs> panel frankly <laughs> um, it is amazing pride not prejudice is coming up with attitude magazine um, but first a huge shout out to the people's vote campaign national student pride is supporting people's vote massively uh, we believe that people in the LGBT community are safer inside the European Union <laughs> Can I get a hell? Yeah. Um, so we're wearing our little cute tops for people's vote. Um, and we want everyone here to get involved with their campaign as well. Uh, we want a final say on the Brexit deal. It's time to get the people to decide what the final deal will be. If we can have your attention for about two minutes, we're now going to hear a message from the campaign. I'm 24 and in my future I want to be able to work, study, travel, maybe find a boyfriend or girlfriend abroad. Last year in Spain I got married to my beautiful wife. I want our rights to be protected for our future together. The EU has championed and enshrined my rights. The EU has nudged and on occasion shoved the UK in the right direction on equality and the rights of queer people. My queer peers and I cannot afford for the clock to be turned back on our rights due to Brexit. The situation that we're currently in isn't what anyone voted for back in, in 2016. Nobody's happy, it doesn't please anyone. It's the worst bit of everything. My mission is to create a more accepting society for future generations. And I believe that that future is in the EU. The European Charter of Fundamental Rights is our strongest guarantee to protect our rights. And the next generation. Two, I have nothing to say because you nailed that. Like.
Welcome back to National Student Pride 2019. Hi. Woo. Hello. Have you all done your business? Good. <laughs> are we ready to go again? I like to think that people that are watching the live stream at home have also sort of just popped off and Pop done their the business. Pop the kettle on. If you're yeah. near a kettle, now you've had your cup of tea and everything's good again with the world. Yeah. If you are watching and you want to join in the conversation, um, please do use the hashtag Student Pride on all your social media platforms. And the guys in the room as well, you can do the same. If you've got questions for any of our panelists, um, we will be able to get some of your questions to them. So hashtag Student Pride. I know it's ghastly, but can we do a tiny bit of audience participation? I love audience participation. Um, so we want to know, this is amazing, it's National Student Pride. You've come from all over the country. We want to find out where you're from. So can we get a cheer if you study in Scotland? Yes! Where have you come from? Aberdeen, Aberdeen. gorgeous. I want to just let you know that I'm half Scottish, so. Uh, what about, shall we try Wales? Oh, no one here from Cardiff. Oh, come on, I went to Bangor. Is there nobody else here from Bridget Jones's alma mater, Bangor? <laughs> oh, come on. Although I did get a first, so um, who's laughing now? What? Did you? I did. Oh, my God, show off. So, I need to come out. I didn't go to university. There's no shame in that, that's I, I fine. It is when you're hosting Student Pride <laughs> and you've never been a student. Yeah, but I've never hosted anything, okay, so you've cool. got me there. It's fine. Okay, what about, let's have our, anybody from like the Southwest, like Cornwall, Exeter. Reading, Exeter at the back. Was that in Exeter? She, My ex-boyfriend lives in Exeter. If you see him, can you spit on him? That would be great, thank you. In a you. good way. Um, what um, about uh, what Londoners? And what about from right here at Westminster? Yes. Oh, no, I mean, thank where, God. The, I mean, where, are the, where are the rest of you from that are being quiet? Where are you from? UCL? UCL. Where? Tell me where you're from. <laughs> Kings. Kings. Okay. Excellent. Anyone, just shout all together. Three, Midlands. two, one. Where are you from? Bristol. <laughs> Bristol. <laughs> Bristol well, I think Plymouth. we can all agree this is flawless, flawless main stage hosting. Love it. Can, I, can we just have a quick talk about our beautiful stage, James Barr? Yeah, we should. Um, we have a very representative flag. Look how uh, big it is. As a ginger, I feel very seen right now on my orange flag. And in particular, can we have a cheer for these last two stripes, please? It was about time, wasn't it? It was. Um, and... Um, we're going to now uh, bring on a very relevant panel um, to what we've been talking about, and it's hosted by Attitude magazine. Get ready for Pride, Not Prejudice, with LGBT correspondent Ben Hunt, UK Black Pride's Maud Gober, Brexit whistleblower Shamir Sani, bisexual model Rhys King, and trans activist Monroe Bergdorf, hosted and chaired by Attitude magazine's editor-in-chief, Cliff Joannou. Um, to get the conversation started, we've got another little film for you. National Student Pride spoke to two queer drag queens who are also people of colour about their experiences of racism on the scene. Roll VT. Hi, my name's Tia Coffey. And I'm something wrong. And we're here to talk about being people of colour on the drag scene. Ooh. So obviously we perform regularly on the scene. Yeah. But have you ever experienced any racist cat calls from the audience? Yes. All the time. Because obviously I'm Chinese of oriental descent. My dad's Chinese, mom's Vietnamese. So basically I'm all Asian, but I just get people going, hello, Miss Wong, or like, ching chong chang chang chang, and I'm like, ah, I was gonna laugh it off because I'm brown. But how about you? Oh what, my God, that's really awkward. What I experience from people is, if I sort of like speak up for myself or like aim to defend myself in situations that I don't feel comfortable, I'll be told that I'm aggressive or I'm getting too in their face. I'm from Essex, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Have you heard any stories of racism on the LGBT plus scene? Yeah, all the time, like Peggy Wessex, for example. So a drag queen recently posted an image with a unicorn vomiting the black and brown stripe. How did you feel about that? So my mate sent that to me first, right? And I was like, oh, what a gross poster. I didn't, literally didn't spot anything. And then he messaged me again. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it further and I was like, oh, it's throwing up the people of colour. So then I put it up on Twitter. Do you remember that picture I've got of me holding the blank thing? It just says white privilege. But she just has this as like stock responses yeah, to these yeah. issues. And it's like, it's not inclusive, is it? Because a lot of people can obviously see that it's 
that's not cool. No, it isn't. It's one thing not to agree with changing the flag, which is still super annoying, but it's another thing to specifically take those things that are representing people of colour and represent it as if it disgusts you. Because changing a flag is not a big deal. If it's that big a deal to you, then you are ridiculous. And also, if it's that big a deal to you, you need to add black and brown stripes to your pride dresses. Mm, very that. Mm. And also probably black and brown friends to your friendship group. Yeah. The amount of people who have been angry since the brown and black stripe have been added to the pride flag is literally the easiest way to see open racism. And they just say, I understand your point, but I think it's gross and it shouldn't be added. Basically to our faces, just saying, I don't think brown people should be in the LGBTC. Their intention is obviously that it represents all of us. If we're going to have a brown and black stripe, who wears the white stripe? I hate that. Yeah. So much. For the people out there wondering, the white stripe is the pride flag. Asking where the white stripe is, is kind of the same as people saying, but why don't we have a straight pride? Oh. You, you don't have a straight pride because you're the majority. Yeah. And the other thing I think as well is like, not conforming to preconceived stereotypes makes a huge difference. So like, even out of drag, I'm pretty camp. I'll wear a jumper with a drag race like slogan on the front of it when people would anticipate that. Oh, hang on, you're like half black, so like you should be like strong and like a, a dominant top. When twist, that isn't the case. <laughs> <laughs> what can we all do to challenge racism on the queer scene? Everyone just needs to understand. It's like sometimes it is the little things that you say and they all add up and like little things that we like laugh along with we just do that because we don't want to cause a scene like you wouldn't say this about like your nan if she's white my nan is white oh, yeah. Sorry. i think also a lot of performers when you go out to see them get a bit too close to the edge when it comes to humor and i think instead of straight up calling them out and like causing a scene because they will shut you down and have you removed from the venue you can speak to the appropriate people and say the level of humor or the kind of things that are being said aren't appropriate if the butt of a joke is is because you're a person of colour, that's not an okay joke. Mm -hmm. Like, if the butt of a joke is because you're a woman, that's not an okay joke. And it's just that line of thinking that everyone needs to get into. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Student Pride YouTube channel. Ooh. Hello, um, welcome to Pride Not Prejudice. Um, not what James Barr thought it was, which is Pride and Prejudice, the James Austin, the Jane Austen novel. <laughs> um, I had to actually talk him round to that. Um, you're watching live on metro.co.uk. It's on their Facebook Live. Um, please tweet, hashtag Student Pride, at Student Pride. Um, this panel is presented by me, Cliff Joranu, Editor-in-Chief of Attitude magazine. So you can include us as well, at Attitude Mag as well. And any of our wonderful panellists who I'll quickly introduce, although they're Identities will flash up on screen. We've got BBC News LGBT correspondent Ben Hunt. Monroe Bergdorf needs no introduction. Hi. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, model Reese King. Shamir Sunny. And Black Prides, UK Black Prides Maud Gober. Hi. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, I'm just going to begin by talking about a article that I published on attitude.co.uk this week, which was addressing the issue about how we need to talk about racism in the LGBT community. It was kind of hinged around the uproar around the Manchester Pride flag, which, to cut a very long story short, Manchester Pride as a campaigning organisation decided to include the black and brown stripes to highlight the issues faced by, by BAME people um, who kind of have been left behind or forgotten a lot in the struggles that we're fighting for as a community. There was a huge uproar, um, which was quite disheartening to see. Um, if you look at some of the comments from the article that I wrote and against Manchester Pride when they announced it last month, it was quite disturbing actually to see just how many people were vehemently against this idea that we need to highlight issues around racism. Um, and it's very sad for me to say that a lot of these comments were coming from white gay men. Um, there was a particular Facebook message that came up, actually, which I'll read to you now. I won't say who it came from. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> name, um, can you imagine? Name, name. 
Um, basically, he says, I stopped reading after the first sentence. White people don't like to talk about racism. Yes, we do. It's uncomfortable to address because it reminds us about our privilege. No, it doesn't. I think most of us have faced many battles in life. Besides, it goes much deeper in society than just the color of someone's skin. Why not bring up class and accents, the color of your hair, being judged on looks, the size of arms, height, age, issues, sexuality? He goes on.、Um, and it has nothing to do with race. So stop including it in the same card. The flag was always inclusive.、Um, essentially, what he's saying there is that he doesn't want to read the article because it makes him feel uncomfortable. And he just, in those comments, he's erasing the black and Asian and minority ethnic experience. It's something that you've recently discovered. Like, yo, this was your first week on the job with the BBC News. Well, next week. Is next week. Next week. Okay. As the BBC's LGBT correspondent. In fact, the week after, from March. Okay. So I'll be the BBC's LGBT correspondent. Woo! And- <laughs> I'm really excited for it, but I have to say, over the past year, I've been a presenter for BBC Africa. And it's kind of been a lot like Wakanda forever because I've been surrounded by black individuals, black excellence, people from the African continent doing incredible things. So I wanted to see what、uh, my first piece would be like as the LGBT correspondent. So I put it out、uh, this week. It was about LGBT history. And it looked at the fact that we don't actually appreciate、um, some of the heroes that came before us and have represented us and done incredible things. So I went down to Brighton and spoke to people, and none of them knew the six heroes that we'd chosen、um, who had contributed to LGBT history. So that piece went out on Monday across the BBC, TV, World News,、um, Facebook, Instagram,、um, YouTube. And in all honesty, I have never received so much abuse in my life, even as being an LGBT YouTuber.、Um, but I suppose it's the difficulty with that was that I knew it was going to be bad, but I didn't realize it was going to be that bad. What, what scared you most, or what surprised you the most? What surprised me most was the lengths that people would go to to find me. Um, so, I was having emails to my BBC email address. I had one email that said, Since when did the BBC allow Negroes to present the news? I had, yes,、um, I had things. I, I mean, if you, you can, it's, it's still up, so you can actually go to these pages and see. And I had internal conversations with the BBC about what we're going to do because that story was just a fun and friendly piece about LGBT history.、Mm. When I'm digging deeper and I'm putting vulnerable people on the news, What are those comment sections going to look like?、Yeah. Because we're all strong people sat up here, and I'm sure you're all strong people in the audience, but there are people who cannot come out in support of their own sexuality. They cannot come, in, come out in support of their gender. So when they're looking at these comments on BBC platforms or on social media, what does that look like? And just before I finish, I will say as well that there were comments within the community. So I had messages from gay white men who said, What gives you the right as a straight man to tell the gay experience? And it's like, boo, I'm gay.、Mm. But they had seen this video online, seen me as a quiet, masculine looking, I guess,、um, black man, and、so、assumed that I was gay. They didn't actually assume that you could actually be a gay man and a black man. And, but the lengths that you would go to, to not even Google、yeah. me to like, see my YouTube、yeah. channel and all of that, but just to actually at me and say, you're a straight man, how dare you tell my story? It's a lot of the reactions、What? I had on the article, which ran this week. It's,、um, They didn't even read the copy. Oh, no. Like, they, they don't even look into the story or the history. They just want to attack and go for you.、I、But mean, you know you what? You've experienced plenty of that, Monroe, in your time. Oh, God, yeah. Welcome to my world. <laughs> 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 That's it. It's good、um, to be here. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow.、Um, that is the problem. It's as soon as you say the word racism, people, it's like a red veil goes over people's faces and they just get angry. And it's,、um, I think the problem is, is that. A lot of people, especially white people, don't understand what racism actually is. And as soon as you say the word racism, people think, you know, throwing things, lynching people, you know, sorry, trigger warnings.、Um, I'm going to talk about violence. And just, you know, really explicit physical violence and verbal violence. That's what people think of when we say racism. But racism is extremely nuanced, it's extremely covert sometimes. And、um, just really breaking down you know, unconscious bias, everything to do with um, the um, 
the insidious nature of racism within our country. Um, people don't want to hear it. So it's almost like we don't even get a chance to explain. Why do you think they don't want to hear it? Because I think people feel that it's their fault and they don't want to be, uh, they don't want to take responsibility and they shouldn't have to take responsibility, really, because the nature of this country and the West largely is built on racism. So it's almost like you're open, it's like the Matrix. You tell someone that they're living in the Matrix and they don't want to believe it and then they just like, they're whole mind explodes because they're like, oh my god, who am I? What, what have I been doing? I feel guilty. It's almost like you're showing someone, you're opening the world up to somebody and they either have you know, um, a chance to take the blue pill and like, find out the truth or the red pill and live in ignorance and they choose the red, red pill. There's a, a word obviously that gets um, used a lot and that's privilege. Mm. And what I learned for the first time this week when I put that article up was how people, they, they get so angry when you use that word. Yeah, I And I've never seen yeah. that before, that kind of reaction to it. It's, so, mm. it's become such a loaded term now, and it's a, a huge trigger for people. Yeah, well, it's difficult, because if someone has had a hard life, and then you tell them that they're privileged, mm. I can see how that would be hard for them. But if you then say, oh, you've had a hard life, but then imagine if you were black also. Imagine if you had racism to deal with also. And then they were just like, well, I don't think, I think, the, and it's, you can see how they are processing that in their head because they know what it means in their head yeah. to be seen as black or brown or Asian. It's quite scary to think that, you know, just because we are LGBT plus doesn't mean there are no racists in our community. Because <laughs> you kind of think we're such a loving community, we look after each other, we've all been ostracized in one way or another, some more than others. But it exists, doesn't it, Maud? Um, there is a lot of racism in our community. Um, I think, speaking from Ben's experience, I experience a lot of racism. I'm um, a black African woman from Zimbabwe and a refugee. And um, Channel 4 did a, a, a program on refugees, LGBT refugees. The amount of racism I got on that uh, page was mostly from um, gay white men because you know they were like oh, but you have children how can you be less you know you have children you know it was sort of ridiculous comments and it's it, it was harsh and it was a, a, a sort of reality and this happens every day to other black people who are like I said, asylum seekers and refugees, or black LGBT people who go into spaces and they're turned away because they don't look gay, or they're just told you can't come in. And you know it is because of their race. So it's absolutely, you know, draining to the soul. Of course, one of the things we discuss a lot about is identity. Um, no matter what ethnic background you are from, everyone has their way that they identify and obviously when you're BAME you identify with different ways or intersectionalities of when your black or Asian identity mixes with your white you know your um, sexuality or your gender identity so I mean that's Shamir I mean you've probably most publicly had to forfeit part of your identity or kind of had it publicized when um, you were outed essentially in the media do you want to quickly run the audience through for anybody that doesn't know exactly what happened. <clears throat> uh, very briefly, so the government of the United Kingdom released uh, press statements when I came forwards about criminal activity during the Brexit referendum, and they blamed it on me being bitter about my ex because one of the 10 people that I named was a former partner. And so obviously I wasn't out. And so in effect, it became the first time a government has outed someone for being gay mm. in the world. So uh, I think my experience is quite telling of the more macro uh, b beliefs of Britain and the West, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes to the way s your sexuality as a, as a, as a white person is, is considered almost sacred. W but when it comes to the sexuality or identities of people of color, aside from their race, it's not seen as something that is valued. It's not respected. And that obviously is rooted in this idea of white supremacy. And it, I, I've never understood the, uh, this idea that white LGBTQ people or that the LGBTQ community can't be racist because it was gay white men that outed me. Mm. It was gay white men that went on Twitter and said, um, oh, he was already out. Oh, it, he's just dramatizing the fact that he's pa Pakistani. 
who attacked my identity. And so I think it, it, there's a huge cognitive dissonance among the LGBT community uh, as a whole. I think particularly when it comes to the issues facing people of color. Like for example, and I will name them, when you have a prime minister out um, a Pakistani Muslim man, knowing full well of the implications, and you have news publications and, and activists forgiving Theresa May for her, one, homophobic past, and two, for the actions that she committed against a brown body. I think there's, uh, there are serious, serious changes need to happen within the LGBT community, particularly when it comes to racism, and that starts with addressing our own imperfections. One of the worst comments I, I've seen on Facebook is when you bring up racism and they're like, oh, here we go again. It's, do you ever, I mean, how do you react to a comment like that? It's, go ahead. Um, well, I actually came off Facebook yeah. um, well, after um, I had a very, well, I've had a few public um, issues with racism, um, but I actually came off Facebook because I don't believe that it's a great way of um, pushing forward when it comes to discussing issues. I feel like it is a very um, echo chamber mentality and it doesn't really go anywhere and it just stresses everybody out apart from the people that are privileged enough to go out and walk their dog after having a conversation. Um, that, that's, that's the truth, unfortunately. But um, I think we just need to think about the mediums that we're discussing racism on and how we can reach the furthest people possible because the people that we need to speak to um, need to really understand the humanity behind um, the word racism, you know? Um, they need to understand our experiences and the truth of um, being exposed to racism every single day in all of its entities. Talking about experiences, I mean, there are often con conflicts in our intersectionalities and our different identities, like Reese, yourself, your parents are Irish and black, yeah. Caribbean, um, and you grew up in Essex. Yeah. Like, where did you find conflicts in those different identities for yourself? Um, I found them, well, at first I probably wasn't aware of it. I think I was probably guarded and protected from situations that I didn't know were gonna happen yet. But probably around primary school sort of time is when I realized other people were more interested in what makes me, me, then I was more aware of. I think where I was, I hided who I was for a long time, so I didn't know who I was. And I wouldn't realize until someone would come at me with a really rude, old-fashioned stereotype or some bink insulting. So I didn't, I don't think I realized until I started to become more comfortable with myself how much conflict other people put onto me through not knowing, just not knowing who you are yet. So I would say around primary school is when I became more aware of the ideas other people think that, that, that they don't say. Yeah. So it's the unsaid things that actually yeah. were more prominent than what was necessarily said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've had obviously conflicts with your intersectionalities. How does that affect you on a personal level? Um. I mean, for a long time you hid being gay, Muslim, and in, you know, as a, in professional, you know, capacity. Yeah, I think, um, I think any Muslim, any Muslim, I think the sort of experiences of Muslim, Muslim LGBTQ people are, are a whole different kettle of fish, you know, that's a whole different panel, but I think it comes from self-education. My, most of my life I, I grew up in Pakistan, and so I know, I had friends of friends who had been sodomized. I know, I have, my friend's brother was, you know, murdered by his uncle. Like, I, those are the experiences that I have of what being LGBTQ is. And so, I think when it's, there's so much nuance to being Muslim and gay, and I think anyone who has sort of in, intersecting identities that sort of mix your sexuality and your cultural or religious background would understand. <clears throat> but I think I don't know, it's, 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 a, it's a big conversation. When it comes to me under, accepting myself as a Muslim gay man, uh, it came from education. I educated myself on Islam, I un tried to understand, I read the Quran again, I sort of kept telling myself, I'm gonna go to hell so I might as well learn. And I think through that self-education, I really did become closer to God, 
uh, ironically, and I found myself to be prouder of my sexuality because I was Muslim. And I think that that's, and that you can translate that to most religions. It just comes down to a, a, a really strong education of your own religion and then acceptance of your identity within that religion. I think rejection of, if, you, if you're from a very religious background, whether you're Muslim or Christian or, or Jewish or Hindu or Sikh or Zoroastrian, um, this immediate rejection of your religion causes a lot of trauma. I think it causes anxiety, depression, you know, PTSD. It can cause an array of different problems for your mental health. So I think it's about realigning the conversation when it comes to people growing up in religious communities to actually not saying reject it, but understand it and then choose to leave. Have you ever made you feel lesser because of your, um, your ethnic background when amongst other gay people? Um, I wasn't ever... F lesser is a... Is, is, is a, is a I wouldn't use lesser, mm. um, but I would, be see, I would be judged, particularly within the West, Westminster and the political establishment. When I would talk about Pakistan, they would be like, mm, but they hate you, but you can't be uh, proud of being Pakistani or Muslim and be gay. In fact, I'd be laughed at. Uh, a lot of white gay men don't understand the nuances. A, a lot of white people do not understand the nuances of having intersecting identities and cultural identities. It's sort of seen, you either accept this or reject this, but there's, there's a nuance to it. And I think the lack of understanding that nuance is what has led to this point where... You find it hard to accept that you can be both, and right. accept both Absolutely. parts of your identity. Absolutely. You're not in there, Lord. You can't. Yeah. I, I think, um, apart from being... It's not less of a say, but you can be invisible. As a black lesbian woman, you can be completely invisible. And I know this is true of many other communities. There's, there is so much difference in our community. We are so different, so much that other communities are completely ignored or they are made to feel invisible. So um, I would go back to in, um, intersectional challenges, how I found that I could cope with my, my, my intersectionality or my challenges, my different identities was finding networks that were finding people like me, finding people who accepted me, finding a space and finding a voice. Because often you don't get to, um, you go to panels, I think maybe it's changing now depending on where you are, but sometimes you go to panels, you don't see a woman there, you don't see a minority there, you don't see a trans person there, but there will be trans issues, women issues, and different issues being talked about. And you think, where are these people? Could do you not have reached out to, to those people, but it's being given a voice or finding my space that has allowed me to sort of deal with my um, uh, different challenges. But definitely, maybe not less about this sort of making people invisible in our community. Yeah, maybe because we don't want to deal with um, racism or people are uncomfortable talking about racism but we need to be uncomfortable to make things work we need to be uncomfortable to forge ahead if we don't talk about it then we're going to have these issues going on and we keep going backwards so we need to be uncomfortable yeah, so it doesn't matter if there's a whole big twitter fight or whatever but people need to feel uncomfortable because at the end of the day you give them something to think about mm. you give them something to talk about it it's um when I got a lot of abuse and comments from Facebook on a Channel 4 site, I, I went away because my friend said, it's like talking to the wind, just ignore them. Those gay men don't understand. But I, I thought, no. I, I, I went and I replied to each and every comment, oh, okay. which was a lot. I was really angry typing, but I replied to everybody. And when they replied, I replied back. It was like a, a whole like, war for two days. And then in the end, I actually found that some of them were like, OK, maybe I was wrong about this. Let me just think about this. So I got some responses in inbox. But to me, it was like, OK, at least you went away to think about it. You, you might be still racist and a really horrible person, but you're thinking about it. <laughs> But there's, there's something to be said about being able to have an honest conversation about racism because a lot of people are very scared to voice their thoughts because they don't want to be misheard or misunderstood. But then on the other side of it, there is a lack of honest and open discussion in terms of you know, some people just are aggressive and attacking. Like we, I went to a panel discussion um, a couple of weeks ago and Sadie Sinner from the Cocoa Butter Club, she said we she said something marvellous, actually. She said, we haven't found our comfort in discomfort. 
We haven't learned how to be uncomfortable talking about these things honestly and openly, so therefore we can't talk about them honestly and openly, because when you do bring them up, you get attacked by that. I mean, that's obviously, again, something you must <laughs> relate to, Munro. Sure, and I think the reason why we are so uncomfortable, um, why so many people are uncomfortable about speaking about race is because we don't speak about race, and we aren't raised to speak about race. We aren't raised um, in schools with black, brown, Asian role models and our contributions to this country, um, which I believe... Um, creates this idea that um, ethnic minorities are guests within this country, that this isn't something that we, our generation, no sorry, our generation, our ancestors have built, that we have just miraculously appeared and we are demanding to change a country that we have no right to be asking to change, which is obviously rubbish. Um, but I believe that um, this is the case, especially when um, I'm speaking about racism or we're all speaking about racism and a lot of the responses are, well, if you don't like it, go back to your own country or go back to where you came from. And the reality is I've been, I've been to Africa once and I'm from Jamaica. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's difficult, but I think the more that we're um, teaching the younger generations about the contributions of ethnic minorities to this country and the fact that this country is 87% white, but there have been significant um, contributions to this country from people that have been extremely marginalized. And I think once you do that, you humanize the um, black and the brown and the Asian experience and people and show that we can be aspirational role models. We can be, you know, um, this, we can contribute in exactly the same way as everybody else. Um. One of the things I wanted to talk about is racism within the communities. Do you feel like we talk about racism within BAME communities enough? Um, perhaps not, but uh, as you said, it's, it's a dialogue that needs to be continual. We need to start and we need to continue talking about it. So we, we, perhaps we don't talk about it enough, but we need to start. We need to keep on moving with it. There was a comment on the article that ran. Um, somebody said, oh, where is the light orange stripe for Asians and East Asian people when it came to the Manchester flag? Um, so again, it, it's very hard to represent everybody at once and speak for everybody when we're, there's so many people in our community. I, do, I don't think it's hard to... You can't speak for everybody, but you can support people in giving them a voice. So I don't see a problem in adding another color to the flag. We, we have space, why, why, why couldn't we do that? But it is sort of listening to what people are saying and in people who are working in different organizations, it's like doing uh, meaningful outreach. You can't just outreach to people and it's like pride time and you want to ensure that there is enough color, but it's doing a lot of work and outreach into different communities, outreach into marginalized communities um, and different spaces. So if you do um, a lot of engagement, community engagement, people will reach out if they feel that you're, 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 you have good intentions. In terms of UK Black Pride, actually, again, one of the really scary comments I see a lot is like, why do they need UK Black Pride? Like, what do they need UK Black Pride? It kind of that's the, the answer there as well. Like, I, what, how do you react to that? The, the, the reaction is always, if we lived in an ideal world, we wouldn't need pride at all mm. to start with. And if we lived in an ideal world, we wouldn't need um, UK black pride. There are still a lot of communities who are marginalized and there is space for everyone in UK black pride. People always kind of have this misconception that UK black pride is just for black people. UK Black Pride is for everyone. It is a space where people are free and feel safe and are welcome. I mean, I don't know, how many people in the audience have been to UK Black Pride? Just out of curiosity. Whoop, whoop. Few. Yay. <laughs> you count, you're in the audience. <laughs> it's, it's one of the most wonderful days. It's just so, so full of love and like warmth. And it sure. feels like Pride, the first Pride I went to in the 90s, show my age. I feel like um, it's the roots of Pride. Mm. And can we get a round of applause for Lady Phil? Whoop, whoop. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs>
Lady Phil is a goddess, and what she's done with bringing UK Black Pride to London really has re reimagined what Pride should be in, to, in like 2019 especially. And the inclusion, the political aspect, the um, intersectionality, the reminders of where we need to go, where we've been, um, to love each other, and to take away the commercialization of Pride especially, um, and what you're left with when you take away that commercial aspect. Is it still political? Is it still reminding us of why we need Pride in the first place? And I don't necessarily believe that regular Pride does all the time, not never, not all the time, and I believe that UK Black Pride is that necessary entity. In terms of Pride, you might, you're gearing up to do a lot of them yes. with a new job. <laughs> yeah. um, the Manchester Pride fiasco, when, the, when they announced mm. that, how did you feel? What did you think about the comments that were coming out of it? I was shocked, but then, to be honest, I've been an LGBT YouTuber, so, and on that platform, I was one of very few black men within the UK who were speaking about a gay experience or an LGBT experience. So I was aware of the kind of attitudes that existed within the community. That didn't shock me. What did shock me was the media backlash. So the idea that certain media platforms were running stories around it in a very one-sided way. I don't feel like there was balance within it. Um, but I wasn't surprised. I really wasn't. And to me, it, it wasn't such a huge thing. I need, I need to stay impartial because it's the BBC. But I do think that there was more room for a bigger conversation around it. And I think it was very one-sided the way that the media portrayed it. Is it hard for you to stay impartial? Like, how do you negotiate Ooh, you that? good question. <laughs> so I think it is, it is difficult to stay impartial on an issue like this as well. Because, because it's personal. It's about your identity. You're not reporting on the politics in, you know, that some country far away that yes. is at war or something. It's... This yeah. means something to your person. Yeah, I mean, it is personal, it's very personal. And I think that's why there's a bigger conversation to be had with the BBC around what does my role look like? And I think when I do actually come into the role in March, I am going to be forming it myself. I'm going to be kind of like shaping it around what I think the community needs. And I mean, I'm, my ultimate ambition for it is to put the mouthpiece to the people that need to speak the loudest. And at the moment, I think that is the marginalized communities within the LGBT community as a whole. So I don't necessarily need to be the person that's standing there like championing everybody, but I will let people speak. And if there's one thing I'd actually point out to everybody, it's just knowing your worth. And if you know your worth, if you understand that you have had an incredible journey and you are worth being where you are, and it's about sharing that story, I think within panels like this, I think within, within organizations like Pride and things like that, there are still people that want to be there that are not there. And it really is about knowing your worth, standing up and sharing that story. And if you want to share that with the BBC, then obviously I'm here. <laughs> so, or attitude. Or attitude. <laughs> You're going to Get fight your for your stories now. Um, Can I just add? Yes, of course. And in my working in politics and seeing the, the the way that British politics works. And I, th I can sort of, un I sort of have sort of learnt a lot about the way the British public work. And within the LGBT community, in my personal opinion, and I think most would agree, the, the LGBT community's focus, ha particularly with institutions such as publications or you know, events like Pride, have become so focused on impartiality and have become so focused on, like you said, on forgetting that being LGBTQ is political. Our identities are political. So if you say, oh no, we can't talk about this because um, it's not, uh, it's like too controversial, then you're not being LGBT, you're not part of, you can't be part of the community. How can you say you're part of the LGBT community or working for the community when you're impartial? Like, for example, if you're Pink News and putting Theresa May a month after she has outed a gay Pakistani man, how is that being working for the community? If you're, and I will say this, if you're Peter Thatchell and forgiving Theresa May for her actions, her homophobic actions, or for outing a Muslim man for the whole of the community, how is that benefiting the community? This focus on impartiality, this focus on not being political, is what has driven the LGBTQ community and the people of color within the LGBT community to the ground. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired. I'm so tired. I'm so glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that.
we're not impartial when it comes to misogyny. We're not impartial Absolutely. when it comes to homophobia against white gay men. Yeah. But there seems to be a real lapse in judgment when it comes to the oppression of black and brown and Asian bodies. There really does. And, you know, it's, and transphobia as well. It's almost like at this moment in time in the British press, transphobia is seen as an opinion. Mm. And transphobia can never be seen as an opinion. It's wrong. Yeah, so the fact that we're giving platforms to known transphobic women, especially um, transphobic exclusion radical feminists, or I like to call them transphobes, um, the fact that we're giving them platforms and allowing them to spread this yeah. hate. You can have an opinion and you can have free speech, yes, but then if you abuse your freedom yeah. of speech Absolutely. and dis and um, disowning people's rights yeah, to their identity. I, f I feel that we really, and as you know, the old, the old saying goes, if you're impartial in um, instances of oppression, then you side with the oppressor. So if you're not passing in an opinion, and sorry, this is not shade at you, babe. I know, I'm it's, 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 this is, this, it goes you. down Go to on. systems, it's systemic racism. It stops yeah. people from being able to speak Absolutely. up. So if you're not speaking up, <laughs> <laughs> the shade. Um, if you're not speaking up, then it's contributing. It's just, you know, putting the power into the um, hands of the oppressor anyway. Can I say something on that? <laughs> Can I just say something on that? I think it's important to remember that, especially with my role coming in, I am going to be the LGBT correspondent, so I'm here to tell our stories. No, it's, so, I was not I, talking no, about no, no, you, no, no, so no, it was shade to the BBC. But I yeah. think what, what, <laughs> what I think is important is that with my role especially, I'm digging deeper into the issues that we have within our community. I don't need to sit here to, to fight for, um, to put people on a platform to argue whether people exist. Mm -hmm. It's not about arguing for existence. We exist, we're here. But I think what is missing within LGBT media, no shade to attitude, but I think what is missing is almost the digging deeper within our issues within our community. This is an incredible conversation. It's the first time I've kind of been involved in something like this. But even hearing those different opinions, I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. There's so much more to learn. Yeah. And I think within my role, that's what I'm looking to do, is to literally put the mouthpiece to people who may not be having those conversations already and getting their voice spread wider. There was, um, you mentioned about our bodies and us uh, being able to own them. And one of the reactions, two, actually two reactions I'll read out quickly from, uh, that I've seen on social media this week is, one person said, I want to read more comments from posts related to racism, blah, blah, blah. Whereas it's, stop mucking about with the flag. I'm not racist. I happen to prefer dating some races more than others. And oh, somebody gosh. else said, that's a tough subject. Some people aren't sexually attracted to people of a different color, but could be great friends. Lovely. Um, you know, <laughs> my response was like, I wasn't talking about sex. I was talking about racism. Um, how do you negotiate people? I mean, have you felt like you've been objectified because of your race within yes. the gay community by the gay man. Yes. <laughs> you know this. Yeah. So please share. Um, I think with my job as a model, it ties in with it perfectly because quite a lot of the times I could get fetishized um, if I'm not wearing any clothes, like regardless if I'm, regardless of what color I am, because I'm a model, sometimes the situation it leads to that anyway. But sometimes it feels like that's what fuels the fire, um, specifically because of how I look or the my race. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like um, that's the character we're gonna build around just the color of your skin. So if you don't, sometimes, you know, they don't even wanna know your personality and you'll just be the mannequin. So you can be fetishized like that anyway. I'm sorry if I say, I have elastic bands in my mouth. <laughs> um, yeah, so you could get fetishized anyway, but it definitely is a huge part. I've felt it, um, the disconnect from people. Sometimes I've learned, like I think I've learned now how to realize who's talking to me and who's actually just, just saying what needs to be said to sure. lead to something else that benefits them. One of the, um, I mean, we need to wrap up now, but one of the things I want to get from everybody on the panel quickly, um, we've got like, three minutes, so keep it succinct. Um, how will we know when things are getting better? Like, what are the one things that we can do now to like, move the conversation forward? Because it's, it's not like we're championing for you know, equal marriage. This is, we're trying to change social issues and like, the minds of people out there and move it forward. So just maybe we start with Maud and we move down quickly. What, are the, what can we do? What do we do? Um, I think 
and said before, we need to get uncomfortable. We need to talk about it. Don't be shy to challenge any ignorance. And we need to be inclusive in all its words, not to just use it, um, but we need to be inclusive. We need to ensure that everybody's at the table. If you're somewhere, you need to ensure that everyone is represented. Leave no one behind. I know that at the moment it feels like everything is fine. We've got equality, people can get married, but equality is not leaving anyone behind. And if we still have to deal with racism, if we still have to do with trans if we still have to def if we still have other communities who we, we have LGBT homeless youth they make I think almost 60 percent of uh, homeless youth in the community we, we don't have equality so we need to talk we need to move forward we need to include everyone okay Shamir quickly um 20 seconds or 20, oh. <laughs> uh, so I know that most people here are white and I know there's a sort of sense of feeling that you get when it's like oh ooh, what, what, what's, what are they talking about? And that sort of feeling, there's an academic term. It's called white guilt. And you need to go home and really educate yourself on what privilege your identity means and, and actually educate yourself on racism. Uh, it's just sitting here and listening to us isn't going to do anything. If you're not holding the institutions that perpetuate racism, like this government, like uh, any establishment, if you're not actually going home and addressing that, then you're not doing your job within the LGBT community. Racism is your problem, not ours. Uh, so you need to actually do the work. <laughs> That's right. Quickly, we've got like 15, 20 seconds each. OK, Thank mine's you, very easy. It's know your worth, understand you've had an incredible journey, and share your story. If you feel like you've got something to say, then don't sit back, share it. Ideally with the BBC. <laughs> I would like to um, echo Shmir and just like speak about how there needs to be an initiative to learn and yes, listen to us, but also go off on your own back in your own time and try to find out stuff um, that you um, wouldn't, didn't necessarily know already. But also um, I want to see more institutions like the BBC and I believe that everybody is getting better. Mm. Employ um, really outstanding, controversial as well, mm. um, but Forth, um, sorry, forthcoming people who are speaking about race and want to push forward the conversation. Race, quickly. Be more aware of yourself and don't settle that you know everything because there's still a lot to learn. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panel. <laughs> Feel the love in the room. Right, we've got to go. <laughs> We're late. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank Hello, you, guys. That was incredible. Don't go anywhere just yet, Stereo. Can we have another round of applause for our panel? <laughs> just having a chat, you know. Goodbye. You, you beautiful guys look amazing. People. How are you? Look at this fabulous co down here. Everyone looks really great today. Is look everyone excited at for you tonight? all. Hello. There's even people standing at the back. Hi. We're getting very busy now. Yeah, um, this is so lovely to see. We've been drinking. <laughs> and speaking of... Who's joining us tonight at Heaven? Um, just so you know, you have a Q jump because you're really important and you have a Student Pride wristband. That does get you a Q jump. But and, cheap, only, and cheap drinks. And cheap drinks. Um, £2.60 drinks all night. Uh, but the Q jump ends when it's full. So just letting you know, turn up as early as you can. I think it opens from 10 or half past 10 tonight. Make sure you're there by then because as soon as it's full, um, you will no longer get a Q jump. Okay, cool. Admin done. Um, we are in a very short minute. We are about to have this is the main event. Are you ready? I'm so um, ready for it this. is the National Student Pride podcast, hashtag Queer AF, usually hosted by Jamie Wareham and produced by student graduates and LGBT plus reporters. But today, Evan Davis off of the news and Dragon's Den is guest hosting for the third year in National Student Pride. And this year, he is with living legend Magneto Gandalf, amazing Gay hero. Ian McKellen. So don't move a muscle that is coming up 
any minute now. I can't breathe. I'm so excited for Ian McKellen. Um, I kept hanging around the lift, hoping that he would get in with me. Oh, you live in the lift. Who are you kidding? <laughs> That's where he lives. Whilst we're talking about podcasts, maybe we should mention my podcast, very subtle, a gay and a non-gay. Hands up. Oh, sorry. I don't know, hands up. We're not a primary cheer, though, school. Which is really cute. Um, give us a cheer if you have listened to gay and a non-gay. Oh my God, stop it. I was so, I was so worried there would be like no one oh, shouting. Oh, there would have been some pity cheers. So we're, we're among friends. <laughs> Juno's actually done an amazing episode with a gay and a non-gay called a gay and a non-gay and a trans. And um, honestly, it's one of the most amazing episodes we've done. And not because we're in it, mainly just because of Juno. It was funny. I made my boyfriend listen to gay and a non-gay and a trans because I just love hearing my own voice. And <laughs> um, what was interesting is I'd never listened to it back because wow. why would I? Um, how much James and Dan just let me talk for an hour about my lived experience as a trans woman. And I think that was one of the messages that came off the last panel as well, which is about creating spaces for those who are experiencing other types of life to you. And so thank you so much for giving me 60 minutes to just talk about transphobia and the press and feminism and all the things that are dear to my heart. So thank you very oh much. God, you're actually gonna make me cry. <laughs> um, yeah, great. So do check that episode out. And we're also going to play a VT right now so you can find out a bit more about our podcast, The Gay and the Non-Gay, before the big main event here at Student Pride. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I'm all right without it, I think. Like, I've never, for example, I've never watched Emmerdale, and I'm happy with that. As, you know, it's, it's a bit like... Like, I'm, I'm fine not watching that. Should we kind of explain what this is, Dan? Dan's girlfriend is my is one of my best friends, but he's also Dan's girlfriend. So it's kind of awkward because we're we're forced to be friends with each other, and we don't really, well, we're not really friends, are we? Are we not? James has taught me quite a lot about uh, gay sex, and um, in particularly like the admin involved. Dom Top just to totally went over Dan's head. <laughs> um, Who's Dom Top? <laughs> a gay and a non-gay on iTunes, Spotify, or your fave pod app.
Hello, hello, hello. What's up, Sheeta Pride? Hi. How's everyone doing? Woo! Hello again. Are you Juno's ready? Juno's morphing into Cheryl quite a lot. Are you ready, pet? <laughs> oh, it right up my street. Um, it's time for the bit, I don't know about you, but it's certainly the bit that I've been waiting for. I'm so excited to now, I'm about to welcome <sighs> Ian McKellen to the stage. I don't know about you. I can't this, breathe. This is, this is so off script, but who here at some time in their life has wished to be one of the X-Men? Well, I now stand here as an X-Man, and <laughs> as a teenager, I remember, I think I was about 16 when the first X-Men film came out, and I really did believe I could control the weather with my mind. <laughs> I used to look out the window and I saw, Mum, I'm making it rain. Um, that wasn't true, I was just transgender, but <laughs> Ian McKellen certainly has been a consistent through voice for our community for a long while, and what a privilege it is to have him here today. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so excited! I cannot beat your X-Men joke. I'm not even going to try. Uh, that was so wonderful. Um, so yeah, Ian McKellen is coming on stage for an interview with the Student Pride podcast, hashtag Queer AF. Do you guys, have you guys listened to Queer AF yet? Because you absolutely should. It is an incredible podcast. And we want to call on everybody in this room to subscribe and download it right now. So you are allowed to get your phones out if you wish. Um, the podcast is in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite pod app, whatever you use. It's hashtag queer AF. It's a sex positive intersectional storytelling podcast from National Student Pride. And it really does deserve your ear as it does keep our conversation going all year round. And there's some amazing, beautiful stories on there. So are we ready for Let's do it. Evan Davis and Can Ian McKellen? We have a cheer to end all cheers as we welcome to the stage Evan Davis and Ian McKellen. Is back. Sexuality and sex is something that's always been a big part of the identity of the LGBTI community. And they're like, apologise, apologise. And I was like, well, apologise for what? And he's like, apologise for being gay. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. He's very much centred around this sort of one image of a non-binary person, which is a small, white, thin child. That's not what non-binary is. That's the stereotype. I was already getting excited about the fact that this could be my moment to shine. Then, the elusive words came. Okay, boys, tops off. The routine again from the top. But Jack was, like, orchestrating the whole thing. It's like his life is a porno. Is it like that for all gay guys? We find out in the podcast that empowers students, graduates, and LGBT plus producers to tell their most hashtag queer AF story. All in the name of National Student Pride. Expect stories about non-binary dating, body image, sex. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We are hashtag queer AF. And so are you. Good afternoon. It is lovely to see the whole pack. I always enjoy coming to Student Pride. Great event. Um, one of the things I feel is there should be a conversation across the generations. Uh, history is identity. And the more oral history we can get about 
where we've come from, the battles that have been fought by others on our behalf, the better. And many of us love our parents, and we uh, have conversations with them, and we have parents who are as understanding and tolerant as they can be, but they don't know our history. But we are incredibly lucky this evening in this very special Queer AF podcast being broadcast here at Student Life, being recorded here at Student Life. We are very lucky to have someone who has lived through and fought through 50 years, more than 50 years, of the most staggering change in the social attitudes towards LGBT plus uh, communities. So we are really lucky and a big welcome to Ian McKellen. Ian. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Tell us your coming out story. It was, it, it, it was about 1988, I think, wasn't it? Was it, it you, you'd been open in theatre land, but you never felt you needed to make a public statement, and then you felt you had to say something. Hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> How lovely to be interviewed by you. I'd, I'd much rather ask you questions, but... Uh, whoa. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, it, I suppose, looking back, the <laughs> there was silence, you see. Absolute silence. If you began to think that, um, you, as I did, that I was attracted to men and people of my own age, uh, there was no one, absolutely no one to talk to about it. There was nothing that I knew to read. There were no gay publications. There were not in Bolton, uh, there may not be today, uh, any gay um, social places where you could um, reliably meet people. The only indication that you got that you were not alone was on the rather nasty uh, drawings of genitalia in the public uh, lavatories <laughs> with telephone numbers or meet me here at 7.30. Um, <laughs> but you couldn't be sure what day they were talking about. That, there was nothing, of course, at school, nothing, of course, at church, nothing, of course, at my home. Although I think I had a gay cousin, but he was, he was married. Uh, so that was just an... So there was nothing. There were... There were and, and, and being silenced, I didn't speak. I, I wasn't a, re a rebel at all. I just thought, well, this is the way I am, and this is... Um, but I don't know what to do about it. So I didn't do anything about it. It, it took me till... Uh, my third year uh, at university to uh, have anything that I could call proper sex. Uh, and even then, it, uh, the world didn't really change because I didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, and seriously, one of the reasons I became a professional actor was that I'd heard that you could meet queers uh, in the British theatre. <laughs> and my dears, it's quite true that you can. <laughs> uh, and so, in my first week of being a professional actor, I, I became uh, more open, uh, and I, I, I fell for uh, a much, much older man in, in the company of actors in Coventry. I was 22, and he was very nearly 27. <laughs> and, uh, but even after that, for another couple of decades, a gay liberation passed me by. It wasn't a proselytizing organization, and even being in Bent, Martin Sherman's sensational play, which educated the world about uh, the ill treatment of gay people in, under the Third Reich in the labor camps, uh, um, I was saying to the press, oh, this is not a play about... Um, <laughs> about gay rights, it's about human rights. Well, of course it is, but it also it is not. And I didn't get any pressure from anybody to say, uh, come out and be yourself, because I was being quite happy 
living openly with a, a, te a history teacher uh, uh, in, uh, in our flat. We had gay friends, straight friends. We went out together, always as a couple, Brian and I. But of course, we never held hands. It was kind of don't ask, don't tell, actually, wasn't it? You what? Don't ask, don't tell. Just. Yeah, but nobody was asking. Yeah, no. And, and <laughs> not, not, not even the press interviewing no, no. Uh, uh, a man in his um, late 30s who wasn't married, they, they didn't say, are, are you looking for a, are you hoping to get married one day? Have you got a girlfriend? Those questions were not asked because it was the worst thing you could possibly say about somebody in, pub, in, in, in print that they were gay. And Simon Callow, uh, there should be a statue to Simon Callow. He was the first, uh, as far as I know, openly gay actor in this country because he, he'd grown up gay, he was gay at university uh, and, and when he became an actor he was gay too and he talked about it in, in the press and the press would not report it. They wouldn't <laughs> mention it because they thought he didn't know what was good for him uh, and so he had to write a book to come out. You see, strange, strange days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, you did come out and it was yes. around the time of Section 28 yes. and that was so we're late 80s, Thatcher government takes this measure, now very, very widely seen as a, as a terrible, terrible yeah. piece of legislation that effectively bans the promotion of homosexuality, but is singling out a particular group in a piece of legislation, and you, that was your kind of political awakening. Oh, to totally. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lesbian friend of mine uh, gave me uh, some information about Section 28, which I was ignorant of, uh, and I immediately wanted to join in the fight that had started. Uh, and uh, I found it very, very easy to, to be indignant and, and to awaken in myself something that should have been stirred up years before. Uh, and uh, in the course of a, a radio interview about Section 28 with, with, with one Peregrine Worsthorn, you don't know him, do you? But rather right wing. I, I, I think he was the editor of the Daily Telegraph, Telegraph I think, for a time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and he was anti Section 28. Pro -section. Although it's on record he had sex with George Melly at school, so I don't know what he was, what the problem was. <laughs> He'd obviously had an easier time of it than I had. Uh, anyway. Uh, we, we, we argued on, on, on the radio, and, and eventually I said, oh, will you stop talking about them? You're talking about me. Uh, I'm, uh, and I think I said, I'm uh, homosexual. I, I hadn't quite got round to using the word gay. <laughs> Let alone queer. Well, that was no, all, okay, queer. That's much well, <laughs> queer was not a word we liked no, to use no, about ourselves no, no. because it was a word that was used about us. Yeah. Uh, we hadn't realized that if we could grab that word and keep it for ourselves, then... Um, uh, that would be a good idea. But that was a real moment, that moment that on the radio, in that debate with Peregrine Worsthorn, that was Ian McKellen, Mark II, now he's serious. And he's yes, and, and yeah. the first thing I did b before the broadcast went out live, uh, went out uh, two days later, was to go up to uh, s see my 80-year-old stepmother and tell her that I was gay. Oh, right. <laughs> At 48. And I was shaking and shivering and stammering. And when I eventually said, Gladys, I'm trying to tell you that I'm gay, she said, oh, darling, I thought you were going to tell me something really dreadful. I've known that for 35 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, is there, there's a story on the Wikipedia page about you. You can see I've really done my advanced research. There is a story <laughs> about you lobbying Michael Howard, who was then the Environment Secretary, yeah. who was taking this piece of legislation through government, he was the local government minister. Yeah, he, so he was environment was... and local government. Yeah. And you go and see him, and I want you to tell the story. Don't make me tell the story. It's not true, the story that I'm It's not to true. Tell. No, not really. No. Anyway, uh, it was... Can you tell it anyway? Because I, I, it's so good. I'd, but, I'd, got, in, I'd got involved with, with, with 20 openly uh, gay or lesbian uh, people who, who started a lobby group uh, which still exists, Stonewall, and, and uh, on their behalf uh, I, I was sent out to, to, to talk to people. And, and being a bit famous, that, that they were rather flattered with the idea that I might, as I did, on a Sunday morning go to Michael Howard's house where I met his charming wife uh, and two daughters. Uh, and uh, I tried to persuade him that he was wrong and I didn't succeed. And we'd had, we'd had a little bit of a 
pleasant uh, disagreement, and so feeling a bit disconsolate, I was shown the door, uh, but not before he said, would you mind signing my uh, children's autograph albums? I said, are you sure they'll, they'll want a, a, a gay man in there? Oh, yes, that'll be fine. And, and I'm su supposed to have put in these autograph albums, fuck off. But <laughs> of course I didn't. You didn't. No. You didn't. We must no, get that correct. No, we must no. get that correct. But, you know, Michael Howard has now apologized. Oh, good for him. Well done. But, you know. Uh, has he, he came to you and said, I think it was all a mistake. And he would... uh, well, not now he said, yes, he, regret, yeah. he regrets he regrets the stance the he took. But yeah. he was doing it at the bidding of... Uh, of Margaret Thatcher, who, uh, although she, she, she worked happily with um, gay people uh, professionally, she, she didn't really understand that there was a need for them to yep. um, join the human race. Interestingly, <laughs> you, you set up Stonewall, a big gang of you, you set up Stonewall, still going, uh, still going strong all those years later. Um, meanwhile, Peter Tatchell, who we were hearing from earlier, yeah. set up this thing called Outrage. Yes. There was a little bit, in those days, there was a bit of rivalry, wasn't there? Oh, absolutely. You were the, you were the suffragists, suffragists, and they were the suffragettes. You were the kind of peaceful wing. That's right. Talking to Michael Howard and not yeah. writing expletives in his kid's autograph book. They were the kind of the agitprop lot who were going out, sit-ins, humiliating the Archbishop of Canterbury and getting yeah. up and disrupting sermons and things like that. Yes. Tell us about that, because was it a tension between you? Because in the end, I think it worked rather well for both of you, that you had this kind of two, two legs, if you Well, like. Peter has no bigger fan than, 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 than me. But uh, at the time, uh, he, he, he didn't really approve of what Stoner was doing, because we were not a democratic organization. We didn't have membership. We were a lobby group. We were self-appointed. Uh, and and uh, we thought the argument was pretty clear that we, 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 we wanted all the anti-gay laws to be uh, repealed. That was the aim. Uh, and with the exception of, uh, yes, I think it's been achieved, actually, in, in, in the UK. Uh, but Peter, I think, wanted to change the world. He thought being queer was uh, made one different and, and there was a, there was a, a different view of society. Uh, to, to be imagined, and, and that uh, was something to be fought for in any way possible. We, we just went in our best suits into the offices and made the case. <laughs> and um, uh, actually what happened without us realizing it was that uh, the government, the, the, the establishment felt they were being protected from the likes of uh, Peter uh, and others who could potentially be violent, I think it was their fear, uh, because we were so respectable. So it was a very good partnership. It was a good cop, bad cop game, yeah. really, wasn't good it? Good cop, and, bad and, cop. And, and, and for the establishment, it, it, yeah. it worked, and they did come right. But I think, I think that's still true today, that you don't have to be in the big organization to make it happen. There can be lots of organizations. And the idea that there's such a thing as the gay community, I've never fallen for at all. We're, we're not a community. There are lots of communities, yeah. I think. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to imagine that we're, we're all the same in our desires and everything else. It's amazing how far the world has come and the debates that are raging now on all sorts of things. Are, I would bet, I mean, I struggle to keep up. I mean, we've got brown, black stripes and yes. I was listening to the debate about it earlier. I struggle to keep up. Do you struggle to keep up? With I, don't, kind of I, don't, I don't keep up. I just get on with my life and uh, <laughs> be, being me. I'm, that's all I've ever done. I've never been the leader. I've, I, I've carried the flag. <laughs> uh, but uh, I didn't design it, you know. I'm, mm. uh, so I'm, I'm just one of the troops, really. But in a way, I mean, you can have... I think it's wonderful that students of the vanguard of this debate these issues ad nauseam. Mm. Often, I think... Are you overthinking this a little bit? I mean, you know, do we, do we need to have this argument? Or, but the truth is, there's a principle which I think has more or less become accepted by most of society, not all, which is, it's a principle about respect for people. Yeah. It's live and let live and live and let love, isn't it? Isn't yeah. that, you, that's what you have to live by at the end of it. Yeah. I, I saw Peter on, on the streaming today saying that uh, in the old days, it was not equality that we were after. Well, that always was Stonewall's uh, aim. 
we should be treated equally under the law. And I think uh, that has really been achieved. It's been achieved in this country, uh, I think, because we're a small country. You know, if you want change, it's all going to happen in this city. And you can bump into people. The, uh, uh, it, is, it is possible to meet the, the person who will make the decision at some gathering or other, and uh, in, in a way that's just absolutely not possible in the United States, for example, where, which is a, a, a right continent. We're, we're, a, we're a small country. Uh, and I think that's been a, a great benefit to us. Let's get personal, Ian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are younger people than you. Yes. I think they should get some benefit of your personal counselling and advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what would you write to your teenage self? Actually, you were teenage, your teenage years in the 50s are very, very different. Well, what advice do you give young gay people who are thinking about life and relationships and sex? Well, my best friend at school, David Hargreaves, we went to the theatre together, we, we did high kicks in the playground, we acted together, we were inseparable, and we were both gay, and I didn't know that about David until 25 years later. <laughs> you see, this silence, what I love about schools is that it is possible to think of a school as the world. Uh, within, that, within those walls, you can make a society. And, and it seems to me, whether they're private schools or public schools, whether they're uh, academies or, or, or whether long-standing uh, grammar school, ex-grammar schools, that the aim seems to be the same from, from the teachers to, to create within, within that a, a, a safe place where whatever's happening at home, whatever's happening on the streets, whatever's happening in the public debate, in school you are safe uh, to be uh, yourself. And that goes for transgender uh, kids too. And uh, so far from giving them advice, I, 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 <laughs> I get a bit weepy. I say, oh, should we, we should have been like this when I was at school. Uh, where, because uh, of course, if you, if you're, if you can be yourself, if you can express yourself, if you can puzzle about yourself, if you can argue and worry and, and, and try to understand yourself, you're going to be better at your studies, aren't you? You're going to be better as a child uh, at, at home. You're going to be better as a lover. You're going to be better in every possible way. So th I think that would be... Be yourself. I mean, and be true to yourself. Uh, yeah. yeah. I am what I am. It's, uh, <laughs> And, and what is, what, what, what is Am? What, what are you? I don't know. I, at one school I was at recently, the, there was a little group that I was allowed to talk to after I'd addressed the, the school. Uh, and these were people with, with particular problems, it thought. And, and opposite me, the, the, there was a, a, a tough little uh, 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 boy called Finn, who six months before had been a tough little girl called Finn. Hello, Finn, lovely. Then there was George here. He was about 15. And he, he said, um, what do you do if, if, if your daddy is, is, is gay and then uh, your mummy tells you this morning that, that she is too? I said, it'll be all right, George. It'll, it'll, <laughs> it'll sort itself out. But he'd said that, he'd come out with his problem and the teacher said, Terrific, well done, we'll talk about that whenever you want. And then here, there were three gals. It wasn't a school that had uniform. They would look sensational, these girls. They looked as if they were just going out for the night, but it was mid-morning. And, and one of them said, look, I'm talking with these, uh, these two here. Uh, uh, we're bi. I said, terrific. But she said, look, if we're having an affair uh, with a boy at the moment, well, presumably we're straight, are we? And then if we have a girlfriend, well, presumably we're, 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 we're lesbian. I mean, we're fed up with these labels. And I saw the light went on. I thought, well, that's the future. No labels, no flags. I am what I am. And, and if we could just get that into, that into our heads that we accept. Uh, some, and regardless of what they look like or where they were born or what their accent is or what their sexuality might be or is going to be, 
uh, then what an interesting world the place will be. Variety is the spice of life. The idea that we're all the same is so dull. Totally. And of course we're not. And if I could see your faces now, we wouldn't be able to find two people who looked alike. Unless they were identical twins. Unless they were twins. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, no offence to twins. Uh, no, no, we like twins. Ian, Ian, I want to move on. I, I want to, because we've got a lot I want to talk to you about. Drugs. A lot of people are worrying about drug use, chemsex, that it's, it's gone too far. People are killing themselves. They don't understand the dangers they're in. Give us, reflect, because you were around in the, the 1960s. That was an era of, 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 of widespread drug taking. Well, what's your view? <laughs> on chemsex? Well, chemsex, <laughs> I, I, I was, yes. Well, I had my first joint when I was 30. So I wasn't part of the 60s at all. No. They were much, much weaker then, though, weren't they? I mean, they were... Oh, the drugs. The drugs were much... But you obviously know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, well, look, I don't, look after your health, number one. Uh, if yeah. you, I'm surprised that anyone uh, of student age w would need the... Uh, extra thrill of, of, of drugs to make the sex satisfactory. Uh, I think that was more for people of my age. Really, who... <laughs> Let's talk about your age, because one of the things... No, no, no. One of the things for which I think you were such an inspiration, and for which there are so few role models, is someone gay growing old gracefully. Oh, yes. I mean, Firstly, we lost so many people in the 1980s. There was the wiping out of a cohort of people who might have been growing old. But secondly, there weren't out gays no. until your, 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 your generation. So you're, you're pioneering a path, and I would say a rather good one. I, I, I look up to the way you're doing it. How do you feel about growing old, apart from the fact you keep yourself very busy, you do a lot. Well, I just get on with my life. I, 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 I'm single, but actually uh, there are other people living in the house. It's a sort of a bit of a... Commune. Yes, and, <laughs> and, and, but it's not a gay commune, actually. Um, well, one bisexual, one guy who doesn't realise he's gay, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're all men at the moment. Um, no, I, I, I feel I, uh, that I just wish that when I was younger, I, I could have been myself, because yeah. I would be different now. What are you... Uh, but, you know, uh, you just, without mentioning, touched on AIDS there. I mean, <clears throat> that um, virus which killed so many friends, um, without it, there would not have been the great surge of... of um, success that, that gay people had in defending it, themselves. It created their identity. Because uh, the government, the, the Thatcher government, the, 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 that tried to put us down with Section 28 and, and, and keep, us, keep kids um, ignorant uh, that they might be gay, that, that they, they had gay friends and, and the world was uh, partly gay outside. Um, that government sent round a pamphlet to every household in the country warning them about the dangers of unprotected sex. Well, they didn't approve of unprotected sex, but they had to tell us about it because it was, a, it was a, uh, an health important health. national health issue. And that's the time when the newspapers began to talk about the idea that two men or two women together uh, could be very happy that, that having sex. That was when the silence had and, and, to end, mm. basically. So out of that dreadful, dreadful um, uh, virus uh, came uh, the hope and the change which we now have. When did you get your first tattoo? <laughs> have you ever seen it? I'm not. I'm not. Come on. I think you should show it. Come on. <laughs> is it there? It is there. Yeah, no, it's there. It's very tiny. Um, now, I've shown you mine. What about yours? <laughs> <laughs> I've got all these cables and I know you have. <laughs> I, I, I can't get my job. Uh, yeah, I, 
<laughs> you, 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 talking of growing old, you took a... You, you know, when we had our tattoos, all the fellowship in Lord of the Rings went down to a, a, a Maori a tattoo uh, artist uh, one Sunday afternoon in Wellington. And uh, I held Elijah's hand while he had his done. <laughs> <laughs> and we all had them done in different places on our body. I want to ask you this. <laughs> Mine's there. Uh, um, Elijah had his just there. Uh, Orlando, you're interested, aren't you? <laughs> Down here somewhere. <laughs> You, you've, um, in your more recent days, one of your later products, your later outputs, has been a, a sitcom on ITV. Oh, yeah. Vicious. Vicious. With Derek Jacobi. Have any of you seen Vicious? I actually really liked Vicious. I know it was a Marmite product. I think a lot of people didn't think it was your finest They didn't finest get the work. joke. They didn't think it was as good as King Lear or some of the other no. things you'd done. I actually did like Vicious. Um, but it depicted kind of a very bitchy gay world, so yeah. two very, very bitchy gays. Just firstly, you're not that, are you? <laughs> it's the, the... No. Um, uh, Vicious was written by an American, and it was modelled on the, 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 on, on the uh, formula of, 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 of the sitcom, the recurring jokes, the, yeah. the caricatures in life, and, and, and his character was that uh, two uh, old gay men living together were absolutely horrible to each other in order to survive. That was the joke. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought we were going to make a, a, a sitcom about what it was like to be in the real world, uh, and th this, this was sitcom world we were in. Uh, and anyway, our writer didn't know, didn't know um, the recent history of gay people uh, here. So, but I, I, I liked uh, Freddy and uh, whatever my character was called. Or was I called Freddy? I think I can't I, remember. One of them was Freddy. But but what, I suppose. But for they, me, because they were survivors. Yeah. But for me, I think you want to be a survivor without being bitchy, don't you? You want to. It's about somehow maintaining a certain positivity about the world. Yeah. And it was funny because they they didn't. But actually. We should. Well, they survived, uh, uh, and, and, and they were fearless, uh, and they were proud. That's not bad, is it? I mean, they, yeah, they wouldn't, they were, you, you, you warmed to them. Look, we haven't got much time, and I, I, I want to go to recent events. So, the last year, year and a half, Me Too has exploded. Allegations all over the place about all sorts of people. Your world, probably, film, theatre, more affected than any other scene. It must be pretty depressing when you pick up your newspaper and you see people you've worked with, Brian Singer or whoever, Kevin Spacey, you see the names of people being fingered or allegations swirling around. Now, I, I just wonder what your reaction is as you see this unleashed on the world in the last... 18 months. Well, frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to accuse me of something. And me wondering whether they're not telling the truth and me having forgotten. I, you know. But with, with the couple of the names you mentioned of people I've worked with, uh, both of them were in the closet. And I think hence all their problems as people uh, and, and their relationship with, uh, with other people. Now, if they had been able to be open about themselves and their desires, uh, they wouldn't have got into the... They, they wouldn't have started abusing people in, in the way they're being accused. We have to... Whether they, 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 sh they, whether don't, they, they don't accept that they have, but, but, no. but, but that, that right. goes without But wh wh whether they should be uh, f forced to stop working, well, that's debatable, isn't it? I think that's rather up to the public. Do you want to see someone who's been accused of something uh, that you don't approve of. Uh, do you wa ever want to see them again? If the answer is no, you won't buy a ticket. You won't turn on the television. Uh, but there may be others uh, for whom that's um, uh, not a consideration. And um, it, it's difficult to be absolutely black and white. Yeah. Did you know Harvey Weinstein? Did you work? Uh... I didn't know Harvey no. Weinstein, no. The other thing is, as we sit here today, Ian, we are <laughs> sitting in a city in a country that is in the midst of the most extraordinary crisis. 
and about what the hell it is doing. And I, I mean, I, in a way, I'm 56, right? He's 79. I can't remember anything like this. You're in your teens or early 20s, and you, you might think this is normal, but it really isn't normal at all. This is extraordinary. What are you making of where the hell we are? When we had the vote way, way back, should we join the common market, uh, I voted against it. Did I, I, Did I didn't you? like the idea that um, uh, this somehow... This is 75, 1975. Yes, I, I didn't like the idea that, uh, that big commerce was going to take over the world, and I thought we'd be better being on our own. When it came to the more recent uh, referendum, I voted to remain, because in the meantime, I, um, I, I, I know that... Uh, European institutions, not necessarily part of the EU, but related to the idea that Europe as a conglomerate might have a message uh, uh, and an attitude that was, could affect all our lives positively, uh, that we maybe might be withdrawing from that. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit frightened of what we might be withdrawing to. The old days? Uh, are, are we absolutely secure in this country that we will be all right on our own? Uh, if it hadn't been for the European Court for Human Rights, gay people still wouldn't be able to serve in the armed forces if they wanted to. Point of fact, we're not leaving the Court of Human Rights. No, I know. No, 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 no but a lot of, no, I just, I just, I just... Um... But there are attitudes here, surely, yeah. would think that and, we don't want those and lots of people alien want laws. Yeah, 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 and yeah. they're not alien, mm. is my point. Mm. Mm. Are you worried about where the country is then? I mean, you, you're, you're concerned about this. Because this week could be Theresa May runs out of road, meets the day of destiny, we'll either vote for a deal or we'll vote to delay. I mean, it, the party system is, could be breaking up. I mean, are you Ther exhilarated by what's going Theresa on? Theresa May, Theresa May be, Theresa May be not. <laughs> I mean, one simple attitude. I think our politicians have let us down dreadfully. Uh, Is that the mood of the meeting, just out of interest? Politicians let us down, yes or no? Yes. Um, I don't know where this is going. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm no, lost. No, no. Um, Are you looking for a I, kind of... I, I, I want us to look towards Europe, and maybe Brexiteers do too, I don't know really, but um, we are Europe, our, our culture is European, or, or culture that I care about is, and uh, the idea that we, we can all be on our own is, is, is ridiculous. Uh, but I don't know, I, oh yes, I know what I was going to say, that, that being nearly 80, it's not my concern, you know? When, when, when the country really goes to the dogs in 10 years' time, uh, I'll be on, under the ground. <laughs> we hope not. So you have to worry about it. Uh, it, it and and, and I, th I think the, the idea that, that people who were uh, too young to vote at the last referendum might swing uh, the decision uh, if, if there were to be a, a people's vote is, is, very, is very potent because uh, it... it it, it's the future. Uh, a wonderful old actor, Alistair Sim, a Scottish comedian, uh, you should look up his movies. You know who Alistair Sim was. Uh, he, he, he was rather r r uh, radical and uh, he said he thought people should get the vote at 14 and lose it at, <laughs> at 30. <laughs> but can you imagine a world in which decisions were ma basic decisions were made by people under 30? Pluses and minuses, Pitching. I think, Ian. Yeah, pluses and minuses. I want to end where we started on coming out. There was a line from the third um, of the Lord of the Rings films. Um, Tolkien, I think, had given it to Gandalf. So you had said, the grey rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass. Can you finish the line? No. <laughs> there was I thinking you'd... And then you see it, while shores and beyond, a far green country under a swift sunrise. Ah, that sounds nice. Yes. Yes, I think I said that in the film, didn't I? <laughs> I don't know how I ever got this part, because I'd never read Lord of the Rings. <laughs>
And of course, the minute I'd accepted the part, people kept coming up to me, relatives, friends, and total strangers telling me that they had. And a few of them would say rather reverentially, I read Lord of the Rings every year. <laughs> and on the first week of the millennium, when I arrived to start filming in Wellington in New Zealand, Peter Jackson, the director, gave us a nice welcoming meal. And that's where I met the four adorable hobbits and the three glamorous ones, uh, Aragorn, Boromir, and Legolas. Uh, <laughs> and and, 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 and a, ri a rival wizard, uh, Saruman, uh, Christopher Frank Carandini Lee, who had been in 200 films, in 10 of which he'd played Dracula. Uh, and and over, over the meal, uh, he turned to me, those wonderful, bulging, lustrous eyes, and he confided, I read Lord of the Rings every year. And I thought, oh, thank you. <laughs> then the killer, I've always thought I should play Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, non-binary, all of you, <laughs> we have been privileged this afternoon to listen to the reflections, thoughts, and history of the great Ian McKellen. Can we thank him? Right. Thank you. <laughs> Evan Davis and Ian McKellen. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs> On the hashtag Queer AF podcast. Student Pride, how are you? Gosh, that was so interesting hearing about Ian McKellen's chemsex. <sighs> Gandalf chemsex is one of the categories I've searched on the internet before. Oh, I mean, thank you again. Um, and again, do get yourself downloading the hashtag Queer AF podcast. I do need a microphone when I speak to you, because otherwise you can't hear me. <laughs> um, We're about to do something quite fun. So fun. Don't go anywhere because we are going straight into what can only be described as carnage. That's right, James, what is happening now? It's always a hot mess. It's the best, most fun part of National Student Pride. We are reinventing one of our favorite TV shows. We are about to witness Strictly Come Voguing. Yeah. That's right. I am the dark and mysterious goblin that is Claudia Winkleman. Here we have the pale and slightly bland Tess Daly. Thank you. And <laughs> we are your hosts for Strictly Convoking 2019. If you are worried that you do not know how to Vogue, Hi, it's, it's fine. We've got you sorted out. Please regard a vu this short film that's going to teach you everything you need to know. Let's go. Woo. Hi, guys. My name is Kenny from the International Iconic House of Revlon. And this is Gemma. And we're here with Student Pride, and we're going to teach you how to do some voguing. So I know voguing has something to do with Madonna, but what more is there? Voguing, well, ballroom, where voguing is from, mm. came from the late 1970s because the POC right. community felt really segregated from the general like LGBT community. So we created our own safe space, our own haven, where we can express themselves in our all queer identities. And then we came up with the dance voguing. That's so cool. And what, like, what does voguing mean to you? It means that I'm able to express myself in whatever queer way and fantasy that I want to be. If I want to be creative with my looks, my sexual expression, my gender expression, just really be my true arty self. So there's five elements to voguing and I'm going to teach you guys through it. So let's get started. The first element of voguing is hand performance, okay. where we use our hands to express ourselves. <clears throat> okay. So we can start with just, you know, Oh. Yeah, be like, this is my oh. hand. Okay. This is my face. Okay. <laughs> you know, and then you sort of, you can flick someone away. You don't want that, yeah. You don't want that bad energy, 2019. You don't want it. <laughs> and you can use your hair. Ah, <laughs> right? And you just, you know, feel it. <laughs> the second element of voguing is catwalk. So we're going to take a step back right. for this one. Okay. And we're going to focus on bringing out the hips and hips. taking a step forward. All right. And then you switch. And you just switch. <laughs> okay. Switch. And switch. Switch. And switch. Switch. So come, come, let's go. Boom. Boom. 
Ow. Ow. <laughs> Just like that. Okay. Now we come into element three, which is the duck walk. So we're gonna okay. have to get on our knees for this one. So okay. we just cut kicking one, kick a leg out per time like this. You got it, you got it, there you go. Ooh, ooh, no, you don't wanna fall, that's how you get your chop. One, two, hey, there you go, yes! Oh! <laughs> now we come into element four, which is floor performance. Okay. We really just take the floor on our own. We, you know, we make it ourselves and we just use our legs, our arms, we just extensions, we pose. Okay. So let's get on the floor. What let's are we let's doing? start like this. Oh, okay. You know, and you just, you, you feel it. Like, yeah. like, like. Yes. Yeah, and then, you know you can you, and you can switch, and you can switch, and you can kick. Yeah, <laughs> and then you know that's how you go into your next element. And you know if there's someone in front of you, yeah. you just go you, you, you. You're not better than me. You. you kick out and you kick back and you look up. Use that hair. Just yes. <laughs> So now the final element of Vogue, which is the dip. Some of you know it as the death drop. So if I get you to stand back so I can demonstrate. Okay. So you don't have to do it as quick, but okay. it'll just be like a quickly. So you bring this leg out. Yep. Dip. Back. Hands back. Leg up. <laughs> Boom. Just like that. Now that we've gone through all the five elements of Vogue, Gemma is going to put them all together and let you have it. Catwalk. Ah, work. The hair, yeah, out. Doing all types, different variations. Oh, oh. Okay, so we right, step out. the floor, girl. I'm eating the floor. All right, work, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Strictly Come Voguing! I feel so fierce. <laughs> oh my god, that was so amazing and unexpected. <laughs> I didn't know that music was about to happen. Me Had neither. I known that was going to happen, I would have walked like I've walked in a line before. Um, welcome to Strictly Come Voguing. Vooging. Strictly come vooging is how I will remember this forever. Can I just thank the uh, London ballroom scene for helping us all learn how to vogue just now? They're awesome. Um, we have four student drag performers for you this afternoon, and we'll be judging their talents. So, yeah, this is how it's going to work. We are about to meet four drag queens who've come from all around the country. They are going to do a runway so we can appreciate the amazingness of their drag. Category is Student Pride 2019. Then after we've met all of our queens, they will be engaging in what I guess we would call a vogue off. A vooge off. A vooge off. And then our panel of amazing guest celebrity judges who have graced us this afternoon with their presence, they will be scoring them as you've seen on Strictly Come Dancing. Then the two highest scoring queens will compete in a final to win a fabulous prize. You are killing it, Juno. I really am Claudia Winkleman. And I left my script backstage, <laughs> so I pulled that out of my butt for you from memory. Yeah, that was pretty epic. Please give Juno a huge cheer. Um, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, Still with us? Still with us. Come on, it's four o'clock on a Saturday Woo, afternoon. Come on, everyone. Come and on. our prize today is come tickets. Come on, four o'clock. Our prize today is tickets to see the incredible West End musical, Everybody's Talking About Jamie. All right, are you ready to meet our judges? Oh, no, okay. come on. I don't think they heard you. I don't think are they you heard Are you ready me. to meet our judges? <laughs> are you ready to Vogue? <laughs> are you ready to cheer? Because things are always better in threes. Yeah, <laughs> now we're at four. Okay, so uh, let's bring on our incredible judges for Strictly Come Voguing. First up from the London ballroom scene, it's Jasmine Adores. Woo! Coming up next, we have the amazing and very glamorous Tia Kofi. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> um, next up, please welcome Something Ooh, Long. Is a wee bitch. <laughs> yes. 
queens. Hello. God, I'm so happy. Yeah. And next up, we have the inspiration for the original Jamie from Everybody's Talking About Jamie. Please welcome to the stage, Jamie Campbell is here. <laughs> What an icon. Um, and <laughs> next up is uh, Dan Gillespie Sells. Lead singer of the feeling. <laughs> yeah, the robot. Oh, Classic, the Maybots in the house. We should say as well, Dan did write the music for everybody's talking about Jamie. And last but by no means least, please welcome to the stage yes, Paula Akpan. You saw her earlier. <laughs> from Black Girl Fest. Give it up for our judges, everybody! Um, what are you guys... What are you... Just, just gonna jump in and say hi to everyone. What are you guys looking for in one word? Poses. Poses. <laughs> Ferocity. Ferocity. Everything. Everything. Acrobatic. Acrobatics. Adjective. Adjectives. <laughs> Diversity. Diversity. You had a hard job coming up with the last one, but I think you killed it with that word. Diversity! <laughs> um, so, should we bring on one of our contestants? Let me move out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm actually so excited about this. These guys have been training upstairs all day today um, with the London Ballroom scene to sort of work out how to vogue and show us their stuff. And yet, vitally, we haven't rehearsed it once. So what you're seeing is, how could we call it? Fresh? It is fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we want you guys to cheer as well, um, reflective of how you feel about each uh, contestant you're seeing. Our judges will be scoring them, uh, holding up their scorecard, and then someone with a calculator. Oh, no, is but gonna... remember, first of all, we're going to see them just runway. Yeah. So this part is not scored. No, they are. I think oh. they are scoring them. We're scoring them, right? Yeah, we're scoring oh, okay. the runway, guys. The runway is being scored, and then what will happen is the two with the highest points will do the Vogue off. Oh. We got this in the back, guys. We got this. Okay, so um, without further ado, shall we take, take it, it to, to the, the runway? runway. Yeah. Oh. with our wonderful contestants Hello. on the runway. What are your names? Dante and Perna. So I hi. And whereabouts have you travelled from today to be with us? Bath Spa. Where? Bath Spa. Bath this Spa. is our gang from Bath Spa. Big cheer, please. <laughs> um, give us a quick fun fact about you both. <laughs> OK, so let me be more specific. Um... <laughs> OK, go on. Uh, I lost every competition I've been on there. <laughs> oh, don't go for a sympathy bow, although yet sympathy bow, guys, yeah? <laughs> yeah, no, we've got that but, game. Uh, uh, what inspired... I'm very proud of myself. You should be very proud of yourself with your yellow Ooh. realness. What You're like a sexy, bee, a sexy bee, a sexy bee. What inspired your outfits? 
This is honestly just where I have my wardrobe. I'm too broke for drag outfits. Oh, <laughs> but you're a, a drag thrifty king. queen, a thrifty I like queen. That. I love the moustache, actually. I'm very into you. Can I please comment on your, your casual shoe? Can you show the judges your casual okay. shoe, please? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we stan, we stan a <laughs> dock sider, I think. Do you know, shall we get our judges' scores? Let's get some scores from the judges. So that again. again. I got my shoes from my gram. Thank you. For the, <laughs> for the gram, or from your gram? From your gram. Yes. Gram um, so let's get your scores, judges. Let's pop them in the air. What have we got here? Oh, we've got seven, 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 seven eight. Eight, oh. seven. Okay, we've got an eight at the end here. So let's, oh, what happened to your board? Do you not have one? We're doing it together. You're sharing. They're sharing. They're sharing. They're sharing, guys. Um, why did you go for an eight? Because she did a D right there. Right, right, right there. She did a tip. She went, whoa, ow. And I was like, <laughs> Wait, I'm going to come down and talk to Paula. Paula's got a seven. Paula, why did we do a seven? Oh, you're mic'd up. I don't need Yes, yes. Um, I just enjoyed the energy and you could feel it coming out as well. So I just, mic'd, it was. Babe. <laughs> <laughs> you worked. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just think you did a really good job. So congrats. Okay, give it up for these guys. We're going to send Ooh, you off stage. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. We've got three more contestants. Um, are we ready, Juno? Shall we take it to the runway? This does not rub off. This does not rub I just love this rose going down here. Yes, give it yes. up! Yes! Category is longer music than you think. I have to Let's this meet the queen. It's just an inspiration, isn't it? I want to gobble it. It's so beautiful. Um, tell me your names and which uni you're from. I'm Rose. I'm from SOAS. Laura's Dante's, and I'm from SOAS. I'm Glandula, and I'm also from SOAS. Hang on, I have a question. What is SOAS? <laughs> school Okay, um, so yeah. it's a bit problematic of a name, but they named it in the 1800s the School of Oriental yeah. and African Studies. What would you call it SOAS? SOAS. Let's rename it SOAS. Uh, that's the new thing I've learned today. Well, like? Every day is a learning day, isn't it, James? We know that, yeah. Um, can you tell us something about your drag aesthetic, please? My drag aesthetic is whatever's on sale on ASOS. <laughs> hey. Hey. ASOS Queen, hey. judges. ASOS Queen. Big up to one of our sponsors, yeah. ASOS. Um, can you describe your drag aesthetic? Gender queer gentleman. Time travel though, the Victorian era is kind of confused at the moment, but yes. You, I don't know if you're Time traveling uh, gender queer yeah. category is. Um, a man once called me a fat dyke because I didn't want to take his phone number, and now that's my entire spirit that I embody. I cannot swear because we're live on metro.co.uk right now, but you know what I want to say. Uh, let's get our judges' votes. There was a bit of a sympathy vote going on there as well. But I think here, I seven, 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 seven and a half. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> so we've got a seven. Oh, seven, seven and a half. Seven and a half. Oh, nine. we've got a nine. nine. You know, get the nine. Tia, can I ask about your nine? That's a really high score. Um, well, it's all to do with, like, look at the looks. Like, you walked out first and turned around, and I was like, so ass, am I right? <laughs> oh, the body is right, yes. And this look, all of the looks are everything. Dan, Jamie, time. what do you guys think? Yeah, I absolutely love it as well. This dress I need in my closet. Yeah. And those hips, girl, that body, body, body. Yeah, body. And, girl, you look so <laughs> cheap in the middle. Gorgeous. 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 Okay, so give them a massive round of applause. Give it up for so ass. Woo! And all that air. Um, thank you so much, guys. We'll see you again in a minute. Gosh, Audience, are you still with us? Thank you nicely. Let's take it to the runway. Take it to the runway. Oh, it's 
Fruit Key Realness. Ooh, yes. Okay, amazing! Thank you! So, Shall we meet the queen? Come over here to the front so Hats we can all get a good hand. look at you. Come on um, down. What are your names? Which uni are you from? Morag Equinox from Roehampton. Morag Equinox. Heather DeFear from Roehampton. Amazing! My brother went to Roehampton. Shout out. Um, that's anyone else here from Roehampton? Yeah! Thanks for coming down. We have some spooky hat queen realness. Can you tell us about your drag today? Um, I base it off a super villain who's trying to get her ear back because I am partially deaf. <laughs> That's so cool! Love that. We love a story. Yeah. Um, how about you? What's your outfit? Uh, I went for Rococo Rockstar meets Swamp Hag meets Porcelain Doll, trying to make it big in 1920s New York. <gasps> Very specific. Yes. On a level. And um, is, this, is this a bedspread? <laughs> that you have fashioned? <laughs> I is wasn't going to say that, I thought that was mean. Ju <laughs> Julie Andrews. No, we stand Julie Andrews in The Sound it of is. Music. There are some cum stains. No, I'm joking, I'm sorry. That was very <laughs> inappropriate. Um, can we get, to, I'm so sorry. Can we go to our judges uh, for the points? What are we giving them? We're giving them an A, an oh, A, oh, a six oh, and a four. Oh, 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 oh. Can I come to something, something? Why did we go with a six? I felt that energy wasn't as much as the other two. You gave your all. And can I just say, a hat reveal with another hat underneath, I stand. <laughs> um, you, you guys gave an eight, so what's going on with this eight? I think it's the outfits, you know, that really swung it for me. There's yeah. a lot of energy and effort that just put into, you know, your costume, so. Yeah. I like it, it's very Wizard of Oz, isn't it? Mm. Can we find out about Jasmine's Fabulous. four? Yeah. <laughs> can we, can we find Jenny. out about your four, Jasmine? That's some, some harsh markings, some Craig Revel Howard realness. All right, we'll no give it shade. up for Rohan. It was no shade at all. Wait, am I? It was no shade at all. But like, miss, like I'm missing something. Wong said, said that it lacked a bit of energy. Are you sure you don't want to change the score? This is the lowest score so far. Chair. What's that? <laughs> Chair. <laughs> I can't. I can't change it. Okay. Uh, right. So give Roehampton a cheer. I. I loved it. Some of the yeah, judges were split, like but they were brilliant. Big cheer for oh, Thank you guys. We'll see you again soon. Okay. And so are currently in the lead. Oh, okay. Yeah. We have one more university to see though, so let's not rule them out. And one less time, James. Shall we? Take, take it, it to, to the, the runway. runway. Instagram okay. safe, everybody. Adore Delano is here. This is fierce AF. Oh, I need to come around and have a proper look. Five, six, seven. The fishnets. Oh, just everything. All of it. The wings. The air. Uh, I need there to, is a lot happening. I, we have to get that in there. Was Guys, a treat come forward and give, the, give them a massive that cheer. That was awesome. Um, what, uh, where are you guys from? We're from Sussex in Brighton! Yeah, I knew yeah. it! That's my homegirls right there. Thank you very much for representing. Um, Naomi Smalls, let's oh. come to you first. <laughs> please be careful um, with that nipple please, tape. What's your name? And tell us about your drag aesthetic. My name is Miss Jasmine. My drag aesthetic is the Pages of Vogue slash Broke Student Life. Yes. Broke Student Vogue. I am here for it. You look amazing. In the middle, Miss Angel. What's your drag name? Miss Angel. No way. Did I just psychically know? I don't know how I guessed. 
that as well. If only there was some clue um, beyond celestial being. Tell us about your drag. So I go for kind of Broadway meets kind of cute, kind of just angel realness. Did you make them yourself? They're amazing. And I think sustainable. This, is, this was coffee cups at one point. We, we like a recycling queen. Uh, how about your outfit? Uh, so my name is G Spots, and I'm kind of like as if your 2007 scene phase was just thrown up on me with a little bit of sexy to boot, you know? Got to keep a little bit sexy in there. I love the fishnet tights. They look awesome. Oh, I thought those were your legs. I'll be wearing those What a tonight. delightful surprise. Um, okay, so give these guys a big cheer. You're from Brighton, University of Sussex. Let's get our judges' Woo! scores. So we've got a 10. We've got ten, a 10, ten, a 9, and a 10. Board. Yes. yes. Okay, so a 9, not a 10. No, oh, it is a 10. It's oh. 10, it's 10. Give me body. Give me body. 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 Do you know what? And the outfit. Oh, wait. It's incredible. No. Uh, oh, Jamie's fixing it. Come on. Yeah. We're going up. Yeah. Yeah. We're going up in the world. Tens across the board, sweetie. Is that a full 10 from everybody now? Dan yeah. Gillespie tells. What, what did you think? Were you a 10 together. as well? I'm just seeing sexiness. Pure sex. Gorgeous. Pure sexy, sex. sexy, sexy, sexy people. They yes. put the sex in Sussex. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I thought that was us, Gino, We're done. but no. Let's go home now. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, let's, uh, let's find out who our top two scoring I'm uh, hoping that somebody's going to tell James through his earpiece because exactly, yeah. I can't count past six. So. Um, please give these guys a cheer. We're just going to send you off stage for a second, but I'm sure we'll be seeing you again in a moment. Woo! Check out the earpiece, guys. Check out the earpiece. I'll literally say whatever gets said into my ear. I'm not saying that. <laughs> oh, bless Jamie. It's frantic. Oh doing sums. Do you know he just said, oh, did you tell me I was 39? Or did you tell me that the, they got 39? That, that 39, we, you know we changed one of the scores to a 10, though. So it's 40. So it's 40. Per yeah. Perfect score for Sussex. <laughs> OK, I did say this would be a hot mess. Um, you were warned, to be fair. So should we find out who our top two acts are? In fact, actually, before we do that, we should play a video from the new star of Everybody's Talking About Jamie, Leighton. Leighton Williams is going to tell us more about the fantastic prize that is on offer to our winning university. Ooh. Take it away. Hey guys, it's Leighton Williams here, and I play Jamie in Everybody's Talking About Jamie in the West End. Apologies, I can't be there today, but obviously I've got a show to slay. So, Student Pride is celebrating its 14th year, and it's going from strength to strength. This year's event represents everything Student Pride stands for. Diversity, inclusion, fun, games, activism, discussion and debate, and apparently some really cute dogs. <laughs> I hope everyone has an incredible time, but make sure you watch the Vogue finale battle because the winners get two tickets for everybody talking about Jamie. Mwah! Loves! I can't wait to see the show. Thanks, Leighton. We love you. He's probably in a show as we speak, so send him good thoughts. Happy thoughts to Leighton. OK, then, James, what's happening? Earpiece, are you with us? <laughs> are we ready to find out where we're at? Um, in last place, fourth place, it is Roehampton with 26 points. Yay! Big round of applause. Thank you, Roehampton. In third place, it's Bath Spa with 29 points. I feel like I'm hosting Eurovision. This is incredible. In second place, Soas with 33 and a half. And Sussex are first with 40. But that doesn't make them the winner. No, no you're not no. safe yet. We are about to witness a Vogue off. It's, it's all <laughs> to play for. It all comes down to the Vogue. So if Soas and Sussex could rejoin us on stage, please, for Strictly Come Voguing. Yeah. Big round of applause, Woo! everybody. Are we ready to kick it off when everyone's on stage? Please stay within the orange and blue lines <laughs> for safety. And also, please keep your clothes on. Thank you very much. OK, um, should we give it, give it up? OK, big round of applause. We're going to do it right now. Judges, are you guys ready? Yeah. What are you looking for again in one word? Just fire it off. We'll start this end. Diversity. Diversity. Adjectives. Adjectives. <laughs> Can't remember what I said. Can't remember what I said. Entertainment. <laughs> Ambition. Ambition. Poses. OK. Take it away. Let's take it to the runway. Are we ready, contestants? <laughs> okay, on your marks, 
Get set. And also, join um, in, guys. Join in. That's that joke. On your marks. Get set. It's the piece is hot. Voguing teacher today, Jasmine, to give us her first snapshot Woo! decision. Um, what do you think? I think it was amazing. I think it was wonderful. Sussex so or Soas? Well, I guess we're going to get the audience to decide. Well, I just yes. want to know that first. Oh, okay, I, um, no, you're right, Jimmy, I like you're right, all of them. So I want okay, all I of them to win. So let's get Sussex on this side, if that works, and then Soas on the other side. Can we have Sussex here, and can we have Soas over here? Thank you. Do you know, do you want us to, should we pick, who, who's your fave? I'm not going to pick a fave, because okay. I love them all. I oh couldn't do God. what they just did. Oh, God, that's so diverse. <laughs> but I'm going for Sussex. <laughs> okay, so I'll be in charge of Team Soas. Okay. You be in charge of Team Sussex. Yeah. It's really very simple. If you've been to a children's party, you know how this is going to work. You're just going to cheer for your favourite. And the one who gets the loudest cheer is going to win those tickets to see Everybody's Talking About Jamie. Woo! Do we all understand? I it? used to be a primary school teacher. Please nod along. Thank you. Okay. okay. So it's the loudest cheer that wins. Um, should we do a quick test? Should we do um, a quick loudness test? What yeah. they all sound like to all together? I think so, so can we just test your volume as a whole group, please? After three. One, two, two three. three. Woo! Okay. Guys, I can see, I think, who aren't cheering. So I think we should do that again. And everybody, a, even another the little practice. The back, who think okay. I can't see them in Hawaiian um, necklaces, I want you to share too. Okay, okay. So here we go again. One, One two, two, three. three. Okay. okay, should we do ladies first? So I'll go first. So Let's if you think that SOAS should be our overall winners, please cheer now! Okay, if you think that okay. Sussex should be our voguing queens 2019, please cheer now! Decision on who won that. I think we need to give our crown to Sussex. <laughs> Guys, that was awesome. How do you feel? How do you feel? Do you feel emotional? Oh, I just feel so many emotions in my heart, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I love Jamie. It's gonna be so good. And the nipple came out, right? You like me, you really like me. Oh, <laughs> but remember, there are no losers here today account. except <laughs> Soas. <laughs> Give a huge so round please, of applause a to Soas. Big round of applause. And another big round of applause for Sussex, our winner. Are you proud? I'm so proud. But my daughters, my girls, you know the choreo. 
You know the choreo, let's go. Back to the back, all together. Judges, are you going to join ow, in or not? Ow, ow, ow! Yeah, let's go for it. Let's all get up. Woo! Thank you so That's much for being here at National Cedar Pride 2019. Yeah. You're all amazing. Can I get everybody to stand up for a cute Instagram shot? Just throw your hands in the air for me. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> don't forget, where are you all going to be tonight? You are going to be at Heaven yep. for GAY, and you're going to get that as early as you can to make sure you get in, basically. You have a queue jump, but the queue jump ends when Heaven is full, so we're saying you should get there at around about half past ten. Please be safe tonight. Look after each other. Look after yourself. Don't be queer AF. Check out the Queer AF podcast and please once again give a huge round of applause to everybody that's been on stage with us today. Can we have a round of applause for our judges and our queens? Please give a round of applause to our production crew, the University of Westminster, everybody from the Student Pride Committee and yourself, you're all beautiful. Can I have a cheer for my James Barr? And a cheer for Gino Dawson. Stay Queer AF, we'll see you soon. See you next year. I'm emotional. I don't want to Bye. leave. Bye.